Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I am your host, John DeLynn. It is November 11th, 2021, and we are so super excited uh, to have a very, very special guest here in studio today at Mormon Stories Podcast Studios in Holiday, Utah, which is near Salt Lake City. Today, we have with us uh, the man, the myth, the legend, Anthony Magnabosco. Hello, hey. Anthony. Hello, John. How are you? It's so Take good care. to have you. Thanks for having me here. It's cool to be here. How long have we been trying to set this up? Uh, months, months, if not years. I yeah. mean, pre-COVID, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. we've had a- messages going back and forth trying to set something up. We finally were able to do it, so yeah. it's cool. Yeah, Anthony, you may not know this, but a couple months ago, I brought Kara on to kind of help out a little bit. Mm-hmm. And Kara is... You know, a bit of a fan, I'm going to say modestly. Uh, Kara can correct me if she wants, but... <laughs> and I busted I'm, in the Mormon Stories door and I said, when can we get Anthony Magnabosco on here? I want to blush. If I have any sway to throw around, <laughs> get him in. I'm flattered. Oh, yeah. Thank you. That's cool. Yeah. And so Kara's like, when are we getting Anthony on? And so I'm like, yeah, we were in talks. We and then started, COVID. it just yeah. kind, of, kind of fell apart. And then I was here, well, I was in Utah with my family earlier this year in July. So down south, right? Yeah. Is it down south? I think so. Mm-hmm. Yes. Zion. Zion, Moab. It was awesome. We just had such a great, great visit. When Brigham Young brought the pioneers here, he declared this is the place. So you're you're basically agreeing with Brigham Young. That's probably worth exploring. <laughs> Get five minutes for a short talk. <laughs> oh, so listeners, many of you will know about street epistemology. Um and Anthony's amazing work on YouTube. If you were to go to YouTube, and for me, I've consumed your work by typing in Anthony Magnabosco on Mm. YouTube, and that goes to your YouTube channel. I noticed there's also a Street Epistemology YouTube channel, but it doesn't seem to have the content that your channel does. Do I have that right? That's pretty accurate. I mean, my channel is all about my stuff, and there are other people who have uploaded video examples of people doing Street Epistemology, and they upload those to their channels. But the Street Epistemology channel is is sort of a community channel. In fact, there's right now, I think they're streaming a review of one of my videos with Mormon missionaries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they do put some stuff out there, but it's not quite as prolific as me. Although I got to say, I'm, I'm scaling back my uploading. I'm not going out and doing street interviews much anymore. I'm tied up with other stuff, the, the nonprofit and all those other stuff, you know, and I can't wait to get to that. I can't wait to get that. But there's so many listeners and viewers that are also saying, who the heck is this guy? What is the street epistemology and why are we even talking about it? (laughs) So I was introduced to street epistemology several months, several years ago when someone just said, Hey, check this out. This is kind of cool. And it's basically Anthony just kind of walking around a park or a, it almost seems like a, a quad at a university and just kind of saying, hey, can I talk to you for a few minutes about your cherished beliefs? Uh, these are my words, not yours. You're doing great so far. And, uh, you know, maybe a couple Mormon missionaries. It may be a young Mormon couple that's jogging down the road or maybe a Catholic or an anti-vaxxer or, um, you know, an evangelical Christian or whatever. And... Um, And he's, you know, the way that I would uh, have characterized it when I first saw it was just a nice guy uh, trying to be non-combative and non-confrontational, trying to kind of get to why people believe what they believe. Uh, There is a legend within Mormonism. His name is Jeremy Runnels. He created a book called CES Letter. Right. Jeremy's a huge fan of yours as well. And so I'm only using that because uh, appeals to authority work. Uh, and and Jeremy, if Jeremy Runnels loves you and I love you and Kara loves you, I don't know how much more you need in Mormonism. I, I love it. I love the ex-Mormon community. I'm running to a lot of people. I and mean, even early on when we started forming these groups that Jeremy, I think, is a part of, there's a, there's a Facebook group. And also Jonathan Streeter loves you, thinker of thoughts. And And I love Jonathan Streeter. Yeah. So you're just universally loved. I appreciate that, man. That's really cool. So viewers, listeners, have we appealed enough to authority for you to say, wow, I got (laughs) to pay attention to this guy? No, seriously, Anthony, tell us, describe what it is that street street epistemology is. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow when we have you back, we're going to actually practice it, maybe do some role play. Awesome. Um, but today we just want to hear your story. But before we jump into that, how would you describe street epistemology? Yeah. I mean, that's the technique that is bringing me here. I suppose it's, uh, sometimes we go overboard making it almost sound too difficult, but in, in essence, it's, 
engaging with somebody in a friendly manner where you're not targeting or attacking the claim that they've made, but you're actually exploring how they determine that their reasons for thinking that their claim is true are good reasons for thinking that it's the case. And it's trying to take yourself out of it and making it about them. Uh, it's, it's originated, I guess you could say, or maybe a spun off from the Socratic method. And then I think we've glommed on things from, from psychology, motivational interviewing, cognitive behavioral therapy. Basically we, we, we experiment and say like, let's try asking a question this way as opposed to this, or let's do this. It's been this community wide thing that others, uh, ex Mormons and, and atheists and people from all this kind of started in atheism by the way, but we don't want to limit it to that because we, we think it's a great tool that anybody can use, but it's, it's not targeting the claim that's being made. It's kind of digging down to the lower level. How did you determine that that's a good, reliable method for thinking that this is true? And when you focus on the technique that a person used to get to their conclusion, as opposed to just focusing on the conclusion, people tend to open up and, and really start thinking about how they came to that conclusion and it doesn't usually elicit a defensive reaction as well. People tend to even enjoy it, which is kind of weird because you're challenging one of their core beliefs usually, yet at the end of it, people are like, they're seemingly grateful for having had the talk and they often come back for more, which is really interesting. But if I was debating or arguing with somebody and giving them facts or arguing verse for verse that, well, you say this, but this verse says this, that's not going to get you very far. And it seems like this approach, this technique rebuttal approach, which street epistemology, I would say, falls into, seems like the one of the best ways and maybe most empathetic ways of talking with people who have views that we think are wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And within a Mormon context, Mormons don't have a lot of non-Mormon friends. We tend, because we're a high demand religion, we tend to really surround ourselves as Orthodox believing Mormons pretty much with other Orthodox believing Mormons. If somebody isn't an Orthodox believing Mormon, we usually don't have time for them or we are threatened by them or, you know, we, we find a way to cut them out of our lives. And what's more problematic though, is now that there's this epidemic of people leaving the Mormon church, cherished friends and family members become non-believers many of my listeners uh, will be included in that group, but we have to figure out a way to communicate with our still Orthodox and still believing family and friends. And oftentimes when we discover like problematic history or problematic truth claims, mm. uh, or even ways the church might harm people, we think that, oh, we've discovered new evidence. So we're just going to share it with our believing family and friends and everything's going to be solved. They're going to come along with us on the journey. And what that often ends up doing is creating a lot of adversity and tension and lots of relationships get ruined. So we've spent many, many hours on Mormon Stories podcast, just helping listeners figure out how to talk to Orthodox believing family and friends and uh, how to avoid what, what I'm, what I call what I've learned to call the backfire effect, which mm. I'm sure you're pretty familiar with as well. Mm. But that's what I, that's where I think your stuff is going to be kind of be gold because hopefully it will be a tool that, that uh, Mormons who have lost their faith or who are, who have become unorthodox. It's a set of tools that can be used to talk with still Orthodox, still believing family and friends. I think for sure, or at least not? something to try. Why not? I, I mean, most of the examples that you'll see of people using street epistemology tend to be with strangers who are not expecting a conversation. They don't know you. You don't have a lot of skin in the game, but you can use the approach. And we, we encourage people to use SE with family and friends, but I think it's trickier because they know you, they could be very dug in and dogmatic in their position there's a lot at stake also just even asking them if they would be willing to explore their God belief with you could in and of itself be a problem. So you have to tread very carefully. There are some things that you can consider doing. So for example, you may not want to question a religious view at all with, with somebody or, or a topic that is very sensitive at the moment, but maybe find a safer topic, figure out, like just listen to what they say. People are making claims all the time, or you can even observe somebody else making a claim. And then you can teach this person 
who is a family member that maybe you don't want to talk about the God stuff, but you can just teach them how to explore a different claim altogether because it's the tool set that's important. Sometimes we think like once you learn this questioning approach, which is really good at helping a person take a look at their views, we tend to like want to use that tool and beat people over the head with it to bring them to our side. And I would caution people not to do that. I think it's really important to try to use the tool to help the person reflect on their views and then leave them alone to process it. And if they come back up to you, you can continue the talk. But uh, yeah, hitting people over the head with facts or that type of thing, it's, it's doesn't, you might get lucky. You might <laughs> raise the one fact with, that was the very thing that they, they were wondering about. But otherwise, if you don't know that, you're, you're kind of guessing, you're kind of shooting in the dark. So it's so much better just to start a talk, figure out what is propping up their belief. Well, number one, ask if they want to even talk with you about this stuff. Some people don't even want to talk about it. And then you can shift to safer, safer topics. Um, but most people do like talking about their religious views. They can't stop talking about them. So that could be a door for a lot of people. I love it. So um, when we bring you back tomorrow, I'm really excited to really dig into what is street epistemology even more than we have so far and the role play. We're going to see if we want to do some man on the street. We need to talk to you about that uh, later tonight. Um, but what I wanted to do in our first episode was just get your story. So sure. that's a bit of a background, everyone. The, uh, this is going to be really valuable. But I don't know much about you at all. I'm really? super interested <laughs> that you threw down motivational interviewing because I, mm. I did study psychology, uh, and that was a key technique I learned. And as I was watching your street epistemology videos, I'm like, man, this sounds a lot like people, motivational interviewing. People say that all the time. Yeah. Well, not all the time, but it's frequent. I get emails once a week by people saying, I went to school to study what you're doing psychology or something. I've even had psychotherapists email me to say, I'm in now I'm employing these techniques in my practice and having better conversations, for which sure. blows my mind. Yeah, for sure. Like I'm just some lay person who discovered this <laughs> technique and started going on the street to, to use it. So there, there seems to be some similarities to, to psychotherapy in that regard. For sure. Yeah. All right. Well, let's start with uh, yeah. just your kind of background. So I'm curious, I'm dying to know, did you, were you raised religious? So let's just start with your kind of upbringing. This is kind of typical long form Mormon story stuff. So <laughs> kind of where were you born and raised and was religion involved is my first set of questions. I was born and raised in Chicago Heights, Illinois, about Ooh. 30 miles south of Chicago. Okay. Are you a Chicago guy? So I worked for Arthur Anderson uh, early in my career. Mm. That's a firm you may or may not have heard of. I've heard of them. They kind of blew yeah. up after Enron. Right. They were the ones who signed off on the financial documents for Enron. Yeah. We went to Enron Earth Day once. I don't yeah. know if you ever went to one of those things. No. It was a big thing in Houston. I think they only ran it for like two years and then the company imploded. But yeah. anyways. Well, I was in Chicago from kind of 95 to 97. Okay. And my oldest child was born there. So we were living in Naperville and I worked downtown. And so, yeah, I got a couple of years in Chicago. And then my sister lived in... Schaumburg, Cary, Lake Zurich kind of area, mm -hmm. northwest suburbs. Yeah. So yeah. I'm a big fan. So I'm like the, the south side of Chicago, very Italian, very Catholic. So. South side. Yep. South side of Chicago. And Jim I'm, Croce sings about that in Bad, Bad Leroy, Leroy Brown. <laughs> Are you not familiar with that song? Sorry, no. I don't listen to a lot of music. Okay. I really don't. Right. This podcast for me. He goes, and the south side of Chicago is the baddest part of town. Oh. <laughs> and if you go Bad down, Leroy Brown. Bad, Bad, Bad Leroy yeah, Brown. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm the oldest of four, and I I was always kind of questioning things, and I would pretend to be sick because I didn't want to go to church, and I just— What was the church again? What was the name of it? No, yeah. Uh, it's Catholic Church. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I was raised in a Catholic family, went to a Catholic church called St. Agnes. Okay. And I, I didn't—I wasn't the altar boy. I didn't. My friends did the altar boy thing, but— I mean, we went to school every day. There were classes and you can even, you can smell the the incense smoke coming down the hallway on certain days of the week when they had these different ceremonies. But I always, I was, I, it just seemed made up to me as a kid. And then I asked my mom and dad, I was like, is this, is this, is God made up like Santa Claus? And they flipped, they, they like really kind of freaked out at that. Like, no, 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 like God's real. And then I sat down with a priest and a nun who assured me, like, I'm seven or eight years old. 
assured me, no, God is real. It's not made up. You know, the adults aren't playing around here. And they asked me if I believed, and I said I did, but I was just going through the motions because I could tell that it was important to them. So I always kind of, I guess I always didn't really believe that it was true, but I went along with it for the longest time until I got married and started having kids and realizing, I don't think that this is true. And I, f I feel like I'm in a position where I could say something or maybe try to do something about it. And that's when I discovered books by like Richard Dawkins and those types of things that really got me into the idea of maybe doing some sort of activism. Can, and, can I ask you a question about Catholicism? Go for it, yeah. So I've got this idea that there are these high demand religions like Jehovah's Witnesses, Scientologists, Mormons, and maybe you could even count evangelical Christians as like people that take beliefs super seriously, kind of almost more fundamentalist. And then, the, then I have this idea that there are like either the Catholics or the Protestants that are like, eh, it's all myth. You know, the Pope, you know, okay, he doesn't like birth control, but we don't pay attention to that guy. So, so I have this impression that belief isn't as important to Catholics and to Protestants as it would be to Mormons and evangelical Christians. What was your experience with your family and the people you knew growing up? It's interesting you say that because when I was going to the church and made to go to church, it was pretty evident that all the people around me believed it, and it was a really big deal, a big part of our culture. So we would go to church once or twice a week. Uh, the, the holidays were a big deal. People in my community, as far as I can tell, really believed it. Now, and we would pray before dinners and, and all sorts of meals and fast on certain days. So we were, my, my family was really into it. But when I discovered street epistemology, this technique of talking with people, one of the first places I went to was the Alamo to talk to the street street preachers in San Antonio, in San Antonio, Texas. And the first day, I think they wanted to know, well, was I a believer or not? And I said, well, I used to be a Catholic. Well, that was the same as admitting that I'd never <laughs> believed in their mind. So it didn't really dawn on me that there was these degrees of, of um, adherence maybe or dedication to the belief. And then I started talking with people who are Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah's Witnesses and people from the LDS Church and then it was like, oh, these these folks are really in it. They think, like they are, they think that this is the literal word of God. And I've never seen such, such zealous commitment to the word. You know, yeah. when I was going to the Catholic Church, but mm -hmm. I think it would be unfair to say that Catholics don't believe it as strongly. But maybe they're they're not willing to go as far as other denominations, perhaps. Like they're, I don't think they're sending people away for two years to go on missions trips, right? Uh, like they will do in the LDS church. So there's, they're yeah. not high demand. Maybe they're kind of moderate, moderate demand, low demand. I don't know. Well, it's, it's hard to put things in boxes. right? And I, I, it's hard. I don't even know what's going on with that church. And this is all, this is anecdotal, but about two years ago, I went back to my hometown for a friend who passed away, went to that same church and they had removed the first third of all the pews and they brought the altar further, you know, closer to the crowd to be closer to the people. And I was thinking, well, they're, they must be having trouble filling these churches. So it seems like there's an ex exodus of people. Uh, when you look at the polls too, it seems to bear that out. Spotlight hasn't been super friendly to the Catholic church. Did you see the Spotlight movie? Oh, uh, I think my wife had it on last night, as a matter of fact. Oh, fun. Yeah. Um, oh, you haven't seen yeah, it? Yeah, fun time. No, 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 I've watched it. <laughs> it's a real knee slapper. I, yeah, it's no, a hoot. No, I watched it. Uh, I'm trying to think of the guy's name. He played Batman. Michael Keaton? Yeah. Is Michael Keaton? Uh -huh. yeah. 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 Yeah, I just I happened to uh, notice that she was watching it yesterday. Yeah, it's just the the priest pedophilia kind no, of stuff. See, none, none of that ever happened to me. And that's, that's the other thing, too. When I tell people I used to be a Catholic, that's usually the first thing. Like, well, what <laughs> did they do to you? Or there's also this misconception that I think people think Catholics worship uh, statues or something. It's usually a derogatory thing. Well, those that's what, that's what I was taught as a Mormon growing up. But I don't. <laughs> we, I, they, I, they pray to yeah. statues, but I wouldn't say they worship. I right. guess maybe technically they do. Anyways, I, <laughs> I don't see myself as a Catholic. I haven't for yeah. for decades now. But but all I think most religions in the Western world are kind of on the ropes in decline. Mormonism, I think Catholicism, it seems like it. Protestant. I, I wish I had some hard numbers. I, I've seen some polls and things. And what I see happening on TikTok in particular it, with the ex LDS church, I mean. Exmo it, TikTok. Shout out to Exmo TikTok. Exmo TikTok. TikTok. That's how I met Kara, by the way. Kara is a kind of, was one of the leading ex Mormon TikTokers. And yeah. 
Well, the algorithm <laughs> loves it for me, and I, and I watch them, and I'm so encouraged when I see it because it's it's you know sometimes you'll you'll go to YouTube and watch a 30 minute video to see one concept being displayed, but on TikTok you'll see four of those concepts. Yeah, introduced to younger younger people, it's just it's it's phenomenal to see. Yeah. So what made you? So you weren't ra you you weren't highly participatory as a Catholic in high school, right? Well, I mean, I I didn't work at the church, but I went to church. I, okay, yeah, I was. So I you was, did your you did your first communion and all that. Did the first communion? Okay. Begrudgingly did the confirmation where I told my parents, you know, I mean, it's, this is eighth grade. What am I? Fifteen years old or fourteen? Uh, mom, dad, they say, you're not supposed to do this if you don't believe. And they were like, just go ahead and do it and go through it. So I just kind of went through the motions on it, you know? And as you kind of got into later teen years, did you have experiences in the church that kind of, cause like for many of us who leave Mormonism, we have some trauma, traumatizing experience. Uh, yeah. I had a really bad experience on my mission, for example, other people may be abused in the church. And then some, it's just, it's literally a matter of like learning history that they weren't made aware of. That was also a big problem for me. Mm -hmm. But but usually there's some jolt. Mm -hmm. Did you have a jolt out of Catholicism? There really wasn't. It was just a long, slow, gradual slide. And I, I, that almost suggests like it's a downward thing. Like it was a positive thing. You know, I became more and more aware of what they were teaching and that it couldn't be backed up and that you can still be good without thinking that there's a God. So it was a nice, long, gradual thing. I, I eased out of it really nicely. There wasn't a big, shocking, traumatic experience at, at all in my life with regards and, to that. And then did you, like, know people that were hurt by the church? Because, I like, you, I kind of I kind of think of the world a little bit as, like, superheroes and non-superheroes. You know, there's, like normal people. And then there's people that like really raise their voices for a cause. And that's, it, it's just a bias I have. It's like how I view the world. And I kind of view you as a superhero, you know, I don't know if you're DC or Marvel, maybe we're Marvel and you're DC, but like you're right. You, you've got more, you, you know, YouTube followers than me, which isn't hard, but I mean, that's something I've been doing this for 16 years. Mm -hmm. So you've got it. You've been, you really care about this stuff. Like, and so I'm trying, I was, I guess I was trying to dig at, what made you care so much about this to like really like lead a movement and, and amass such a significant following? Good question. And you would think it would be trauma. Now I, I don't dismiss any of the trauma. In fact, trauma, religious trauma syndrome is a real thing. And there's great services like recovering from religion that are awesome that I volunteer for oh, yeah. on the side. A great, that, let's add that to the show. Notes. They're doing great food. work. They're doing such good They've work. They've got like people who like answer the phone. Like if you're coming out of your faith and you need help, you can right. call people. Sure. Like, if you're if you're going through that transition out or deconstructing your religion, it's a great sounding board. They don't they don't instill doubt. However, they will use a, a variation of street epistemology when people call in. What do you think might be the best solution for you at this time? They are asking SE type of questions with the people who reach out. But uh, to, to go back to your question, it wasn't a traumatic event. What really got me interested in the whole street epistemology stuff and just activism in general was learning that I damaged relationships with my loved ones as I was leaving religion. Mm, so like you even, did. Yeah. So like even though it was a nice, long, slow, gradual thing, you start noticing how harmful the religious views can be on people. And then you start noticing how they could have been harmful to yourself and probably were, uh, that motivated, motivated me to want to talk to people about religion and show them how silly it was. So you saw Catholics pr predominantly being sure. harmed by either your leaving or other people leaving or just, well, it's funny. No, I actually saw more, instances of people being harmed from their religion when I started going online, like my different groups, um, just going on Facebook and that type of thing. I guess I was drawn to atheist communities and then you start learning the different harm that comes with it. So I couldn't really point to somebody in my life where I would say, well, they were harmed from this church, but mm. I was actually surprised to learn that so many people are, Yeah, you know, that was, that discovery was, was very huge for me and motivated me to want to do something with recovering from religion. But then um, what, what really kind of, got me on the SE stuff was arguing with my family and friends about religion and showing them facts that they were wrong and ridiculing them and posting crazy memes. 
and seeing those relationships disintegrate. Was it, was it primarily again about Catholicism? No, it wasn't even religious specific. In fact, a lot of my family members who I was engaging with in a very crude way, I don't even know what religion they were. Maybe Catholic, maybe something else. It didn't even really factor in. They were, they were believers and I was going after them. So that was, you know, that was my, that was my, that was all I was doing at that point was just sort of fighting with people online. Was this pre 9-11 or post 9-11? This was post 9-11. Because you mentioned Dawkins and Hitchens and Harris and yeah. Dennett and those guys. And, you know, those four horsemen of the apocalypse, they kind of came out of the Twin Towers and Pentagon disasters. Yeah. Well, it was that Dawkins, Dawkins book that I read, The God Delusion, really inspired me to want to do something. So that's when I just clumsily started using counter apologetics. So somebody says that this is true, and then you would look for a verse in their holy book to show how ridiculous their views are or something. And then you start noticing that your relationships are falling apart because of that. <laughs> you know. And then you hear that there might be a better way of talking with people. Then I was really drawn to the street epistemology approach. The the not let me I don't want to argue with you, but ask you questions. And and that was really cool. So I started going out in public, doing it with street preachers and then just regular people and then going to college campuses and that type of thing. Did the term street epistemology exist before you kind of coined it? Did you coin the term? Or? No, no, I didn't coin Is it. Is there a tradition? It actually originated in a book called A Manual for Creating Atheists. Have you heard of this book? It's only my favorite. <laughs> Is that Bogosian? Peter Bogosian yeah. wrote yeah. the book in 2013. And I read that book. I was actually at a conference in Oregon for the Freedom... 2000 what? 2013. Okay. Did I say... What did I say? No, that's good. That's good. <laughs> yeah. So that's 12 years. That's 12 years after 9-11. So right. quite a long time after. Yeah. He kind of missed the window on being a horseman, okay. I okay. guess, for whatever that's worth. But so now I read, I read his book and that really... It really appealed to me because I wanted to have better talks with people yet still challenge them on their views. And this book was purporting that this is a better way of doing that. So I was, I was all in. So he used that term street epistemology in the book, a manual for creating atheists. I th think the term is in the book. And that was the and first so, time you had stumbled on the term. I, exactly. Like I knew the word street, but I'd never heard of epistemology <laughs> before. Okay. Who, who knows yeah. what epistemology is? Which yeah. Yeah. It's, it's ex-Mormons ex do. <laughs> they probably do. Yeah, yeah, do you want to define epistemology as well? Sure. Well, the the official word of it, the term of it is is the theory of knowledge or the study of knowledge. But when we're using street epistemology, I'm not exploring what you know. We're exploring how you concluded that you think that you know it. Mm -hmm. And it's a it's a different animal. So the the name is actually somewhat problematic in a lot of different ways. But but uh, that was my first time encountering that word. I, I sometimes my shorthand explanation is just how we know stuff. Yeah. How we know stuff. Right. Yeah. Right. So okay. Like when you say how you prop up your beliefs, is that another good way to put it? Uh, like what props up your beliefs? The foundation that the your foundation. beliefs, yeah. Well, that might be a little bit, no, people that, might take that, offense that's at decent. that. Maybe prop, prop up. up. Prop up, yeah. Well, I do actually like viewing beliefs as a structure or a Jenga tower of sorts, you know, <laughs> because you have your core belief up here and then you have your reasons. And then maybe down here you have, ideally, the method that you use to test your reasons to be sure that what you think is true is true. That's kind of the model that we've come up with for, to explain what street epistemology is. Uh, a lot of people discover that they don't have a method. They, they just, they, they were raised with this belief or they get a good feeling from the belief and never really set out to, to, to figure out that it was true or not. Uh, a lot of people just don't even consider that type of stuff. Yeah. I like how you said Jenga tower. I think that's really helpful for ex Mormons because so much of what, we were constantly in church every Sunday bearing our testimony. We always are told that we'll gain a testimony by bearing it. And then suddenly you find yourself at like 30 years old being confronted with like the CES letter. And you're like, did I really know that the whole time? Okay. What about uh, the spirit that I, that will overcome all that, like any uncomfortable history that I find. Okay. That's more like elevated emotion. Okay. And so you start looking at each Jenga piece, taking it out examining it and you're like, okay, actually this foundation of what I was propping up, like you said, at the top, that tower is not what I thought it was. And piece by piece, and sometimes it takes, you know, a decade for some people to leave the church and it takes one Jenga piece at a time and they want to look at all of them. Other people, they read the CS letter in one night and they realize the foundation wasn't sound. Exactly. Very well. Yeah. I, I totally, I, I love looking at beliefs in that way. And what we've, we're also noticing is that 
while you can inspect your own beliefs, you can you can inspect your own Jenga, Jenga tower of beliefs. It seems better if you allow somebody to go on that exploration with you, which is what we try to do in SE in street epistemology, right? Like I want to work with you to figure out how you concluded that what you think is true is true. And we do that with, with us asking, well, with me asking questions. And that seems to result in a much deeper dive, a much clearer view into how they're propping up their belief in the first place. Before we dive into that, um, so you graduated from high school around what year? I was class of 88. Okay. So you're a year younger than me. I think so. Yeah. yeah that's what Carol said. And did you go to college? Yes. What did you do after high school? After high, sc after high school, I spent a year in Istanbul, Turkey as an exchange student. Whoa, learned, that's kind of cool. I was 18 years old and traveling all over that city. It was amazing. And also seeing a lot of people who believed in a different religion and they were fervent believers in it. So Islam? Islam. Yeah. So all this stuff is crystallizing as I'm getting older and you start realizing how people are thinking about this stuff. And then I went to college. Why'd you choose Istanbul? It's a long story. I'll shorten it. And it's kind of funny, but I stumbled across the Rotary Club. I think they had sent an exchange student to our high school from, I don't know, some country. And I was really intrigued by the idea of, of doing a, a, a my, basically repeating my senior year of high school in a different country. And the form that we were given to fill out had a list of 80 countries. And they said, just put them in numerical order with which ones you want to go to. So by the time I got to my fourth or fifth choice, I just put numbers by all the rest. Because <laughs> I figured, of course, I'm going to get my top 10, right? And it turned out that Turkey was my 17th choice <laughs> and I was the only one to list it so high. <laughs> so, so I ended up uh, following through and going there and spent the whole year in Turkey. I love the story of how kind of like the Arab world was kind of like led civilization for, for several centuries Seemed before like they were ahead of the times, right? On Mathematics and yeah. Yeah. Uh, many stars, I think, are named have Arabic sounding names, uh, Arabic names. Is that right? I think so. Did that influence you to see that a civilization could maybe take some steps backwards? Did that even? You occur? know, I was eighteen at the time. Oh, I think okay. I was more important. You know, I was more yeah. focused on just traveling across the city and finding McDonald's. You know, that type <laughs> of thing because I didn't really like the food there. Oh, you didn't? <laughs> it's not like pita and hummus, and you know. Actually, they had some really good street food. Was, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's where the street comes in. For the street epistemology? <laughs> Maybe so. Maybe that's where it originated from. Born on the streets. <laughs> okay. So did you, after you leave Turkey, what'd you do? Left Turkey, uh, went two years to a community college near my house. And then- In I, South Side? South Side of Chicago. Okay. Right. And then I went to Western Illinois University. It's about four Western hours away Illinois? from my house. It's in Macomb, Illinois. It's like on the border of Illinois and Iowa. Were you a- uh, White Sox fan then? Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. Not a Cubs fan. Yeah. Now you were probably a Cubs fan being North side like that. No, I grew up in Houston. So okay. I was an Astros fan. Okay. Yeah. 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 So um, then after that, I got me, I went, I you know, got, got a job after graduating college. What'd you study? What'd you study? I at studied Western Illinois. I studied logistics and physical distribution. What? Mm -hmm. Transportation. Uh, and then I got a minor in inf in information systems. What were you wanting to do with that? Uh, well, that's a great question. I think I just wanted to get a decent job with a carrier or a manufacturer. And I ended up getting a really good job with a chemical company and traveled and uh, it was awesome. Yeah. Okay. And okay. And so where were you in life and in your career and in your family when you started like when you when you read Bogosian's book and you started to think about wanting to do this more seriously where was i well like, i think so was, my kids were probably pretty pr a little bit younger but asking the big questions you and know, you were in san antonio by this point yeah, or? i'm in texas and the kids are coming home saying that wondering if they believed in god or if we believed in god and the teacher was saying something about this or that or my, my classmate told me that I would be going to hell or something if I didn't believe. <laughs> so it st you know, started dawning on me like, well, what did we want to teach the kids? And then I started coming across atheist content 
And then I discovered, then I signed up for Freedom From Religion Foundation. And I was at their conference where I met Bogosian, who was giving the talk and promoting this book. Do you remember around what year? I think that was 2013. Okay. Yeah. So 2013 read the book. And then I, I said, there are no examples of people you doing this method. How can I learn how to do this if there are no examples? So, and I, I if, if you've pro. already answered this, forgive me. Mm -hmm. So, was there someone who developed street epistemology? Is there a name that we can tie to it before Bogosian, like a famous Socrates? Okay, <laughs> but the, but then <laughs> who, coined, who coined the term pre-Bogosian? Is there a book on it? No. No, street epistemology, yeah. that term was coined in that book, A Manual for Creating Atheists. Really? Yeah. Okay. He yeah. was just- I think it's on the for, first page or something. It was basically, he's basically just saying, hey, Socratic method may be more effective than interrogation. And I'm going to call it street epistemology because it's basically a way to find out why people believe what they believe. It turned out that he is or was a philosophy professor who, of course, still across- Oregon, right? Portland State Portland or something? Portland State, yeah. so doing philosophy there- heavily into atheism. And I think he had a very close family member who was also a therapist working with addicts, drug addicts. And I think he put all of that together and started realizing, oh, wow, we can actually use this approach to explore belief claims. Yeah. Much in the same way we might explore somebody's addiction or, or a, a behavior maybe that they want to cease Yeah. type of thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So around 2012, 2013. Yeah. You are pretty advanced in your, okay. How many children do you have by this point? Two kids still have two kids. Uh, okay. so yeah, they were, they were rather young and you were still doing this job with the chemical company, um, in San Antonio. So, okay. So, well, okay. We're skipping lots of years here. So after the chemical company, then I shifted into consulting. <laughs> I was working for a supply chain software consulting company and traveling oh. all over the, all over the country, all over the world. That was a little tough being gone, leaving on Monday, coming back on Thursday, and then the kids not recognizing you, you know, when they, yeah. uh, when you come home from work. But so then I got a job locally, started my own business, a iPhone, iPod repair business. Really? It was really fun and cool. Like crack screens and stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Back when you could actually get the parts and then, you know, pee build a decent wage and still make a little bit of money. But it became too much of a challenge. And then I wanted to do something with regards to this activism and atheism and, and uh, there were nobody, as far as I can tell, uploading examples of people doing street epistemology. Hmm. So other than the examples that were in the book that were just maybe half of a page, people may have been talking about their conversations, but I think I was probably the first one to actually start recording exchanges and then putting them on YouTube and calling them street epistemology, yeah. which is really kind of a far cry from doing street epistemology. Cause I still didn't quite know what I was doing. I was still arguing with street preachers and people and that type of thing. So, um, like I'm thinking back to the day that I like learned that podcasts existed. This is 2005. And then I'm yeah. like, how do I do that? And then I like go buy a microphone. And then I like, how do you up, how do you make an MP3 and upload it? You know what I mean? I'm thinking back. So I'm channeling, I'm, I'm trying to get, I'm getting in the space where you're like, okay, I read Bogosian's book and I want to pursue this. So take us on that journey of like, what was your first step in mm. kind of going down this path? How did, how did it start? I think it started with me recognizing that there weren't a lot of examples of people doing this approach and I wanted to do it. So I got a camera, I bought a whiteboard and uh, some markers and that type of thing and, and thought, well, I want to talk to religious people. Where can I reliably find them? And I thought, well, let me just go down to the Alamo because I, I think I'd stumbled across one time when I went to visit or something that the, the street preachers usually gather there on the weekends and in fact, I think I even went a couple times without my cameras, just recording and just listening to what they had to say um, and taking notes and that type of thing, which in hindsight, you really didn't have to do. But yeah, I started off with that and then it just kind of grew from there. But I got to tell you, the growth that really happened was when I started putting the conversations on my YouTube channel and sharing them in a Facebook group with people who were also interested in street epistemology who would give me feedback and give me suggestions on how to improve. And that was really huge. Where was the first place you went? The first place I went was in front of the Alamo 
talking to people, but it's so noisy and chaotic there. And usually the people that are there to preach are there to preach. They're not there to reflect. It dawned on me, oh, I should probably find a different location. So I started going to trails and campuses, universities in my town, basically just any place that I can drive to, you know, get out and set, set up really quick and break down really quick. And when you had to, so I married, I imagine you're, you're, so you're married, mm -hmm. right? You have, I don't want to make any assumptions about your partner. So I'll just say your partner. Um, so, uh, I'm trying to imagine that conversation where you're like, Hey honey, I'm going out. <laughs> I got a camera and I'm going out to ask a bunch of people questions about their beliefs at the Alamo and other, what was that? And like, what was that conversation like? How did you explain it? Mm -hmm. Because there are a lot of things, you know, <laughs> I know it's like to be a dad, right? You know, there's a lot of things you could be doing, of a lot, big old honeydew list. Oh, sure. How do you explain that to your spouse that probably has things that they'd rather you be doing? And then I'm also really curious to know what your vision was of how you saw this playing out, Ooh. you know, and if you had any idea of how it would play wow. out, well, okay. how did it start? These are good questions. <laughs> so with regards to my spouse, we... I don't remember the exact details, but I do remember her being very concerned about what I was attempting to do. <laughs> so I think I had actually done it once and then put some videos on YouTube and showed her one. And it was just a horrible example where it was combative. Are these videos still up? The early ones? They're still on my channel, but they're unlisted, okay. but they're in okay. a playlist that is public. So you can find them. So Kara, we'll, we'll ask you. You can find links. them. Oh, I've got some horrible ones out there. They're <laughs> so, so bad. They're exa so well, cringy. Bad examples. So I, I think she, she watched a very bad example of me arguing with a street preacher. And then the next time I said, I'd really like to go out and do this again. And she <laughs> insisted that I hire somebody to, to be a bodyguard off to the side. And this is a true story. And I, I literally did that. So I called somebody and found somebody for like the next two weekends or three weekends. I had somebody there, but right around that time I was realizing, well, I don't want to be arguing with them. That's not what I'm out here to do, but it was hard to get past that hump because that's all, that's all that I knew how to do. And it was, was real, to argue debate was to argue and debate, which yeah. elicited that very uh, combative response back from them. Yeah. So as I started realizing that I don't have to do that and it's better to use the, the nicer approach to so the, the SE approach, it became evident that I didn't need that stuff. I didn't need a backup. So we, you know, that kind of all fell the wayside. And um, I mean, I think the videos today speak for themselves. If you look at an old example, that actually would be kind of funny to, to maybe show like, or play like a really old one and compared to a new one, it's night and day difference. Maybe we'll have, we'll have Carrie find a couple examples and splice them in. She maybe, likes to edit. Maybe so. Yeah. Um, and I, I know this is going to sound repetitive, but like, I'm trying to imagine that conversation where your wife says, honey, why are you doing this? Yeah. What would you have said? I think I would have her. said, like, I, I think I would have said, I'm really worried what's happening with religion and people in this country and the influence that it's having on our culture. I think, I, I think that would have been my answer then. And it probably still is my answer today. Uh, although now I'm, I'm, I'm more aware of the harm that these religious beliefs cause. Like that is probably even superseded it now that I think about it. So she had said, no, wait, religion, it's just these nice little churches people go to and they raise their kids and they learn to be a good person. Why is that so damaging? Why do you, yeah. Why do you care? Yeah. Um, that is kind of a response that I would get from some people, even my close family members. Why do you, why do you care enough to do this? Well, where's the harm? I, that was probably my answer. Well, what's the harm of not doing it or what's the harm of doing it? Um, that's also important. Yeah. yeah. I guess, uh, hmm, that's a tough question. What was motivating me to do it? I think I wanted, initially I wanted to show examples of this technique in action, whether it worked or not. It was almost kind of like a proof of concept. Mm -hmm. Does this thing do what the author purports that it can do? And when I first started off, I wasn't really quite using it right. But as I started using it, it was evident that there was something to it. And that became motivating. People were eager to see me and have more talks as opposed to being combative with me. And I was even seeing people reflecting on their views and even lowering their confidence to the point of getting rid of the beliefs. So that was a huge wake up call. Like there might be something to this technique that could be useful for people, not just for atheists who are talking to theists, but for everybody about all these deeply held beliefs that we have. And when, and I, and I don't know, you may be uncomfortable even going here, but if you were, you know, I could enumerate some of the potential harms that might've been disturbing you. You know, there's abuse of children and people there's, money that's being paid. There's people basing their lives on magical thinking. 
uh, there's wars, uh, violence, misogyny, racism, sexism, homophobia. Is that kind of starting to capture some of the things that might have motivated you? Or are there others that you would add or that were even more important? I think it was primarily the harm that the religions were causing people, but I was becoming increasingly aware of that because I was entering a community of people, atheists, who were also learning this technique, this rebuttal technique of street epistemology. And along with it, they were sharing their 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 stories, their horror stories, and the trauma that they, they were even still experiencing today. Ex-religious people? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So then stories. that motivates you even more. But here, it's, it's weird because that was motivating me to see the the necessity maybe of using this approach with people who hold such views. But then you also start realizing that you can use street epistemology approach for other claims too, that it's, it's, it's broader than just this one narrow niche. That's very important to me. Um, and that inspired me, like, how can we get these tools? How can we make them simpler to understand for one thing and see more examples of people using it and trying to develop it even further? That was just a, a big part of it for me. So, so you get the camera, you, uh, tell your wife you're going out and you start doing these things at first, the, the videos don't go so well and you realize you don't want to be combative. And so you start honing the craft a little bit. Right. And were you, were you posting the videos to YouTube each time? Were you thinking about this becoming like a social media movement at the time? Okay. Yeah. I'm glad we came back to that because I wanted to speak to that. So after I read Bogosian's book and I decided to go out and start doing talks. I remember as I was walking out for the very first time, turning the camera around on myself and saying, okay, here I am. I'm trying this thing called street epistemology and I hope it does what it says. Like if, if this thing catches on, it's going to be really big. I think from the beginning, I was optimistic that there was something to it. So I think I was biased in favor of it working and being effective and maybe that in a way made me determined to make it effective in mm -hmm. some way or mm -hmm. put more effort into it because yeah. it seemed like if there really is something to this, this is huge. So I didn't, I think after I read the book, I was convinced that it was a better approach than what I had been using. And even though I was doing a, a poor version of it at the start, there were still glimmers of, of something to it. So I think early on, I always suspected that it could be a big thing and it seems like it has, and it, it's really kind of blossomed. And now here we are sitting and talking. So at some point you're just making some short videos, but then at some point you're creating a channel. Was YouTube your first method of distribution? It was my very first method. Converting the videos into audio and putting them on a podcast didn't happen until two years into it. I wasn't really thinking of marking it, marketing it or growing it. It just sort of was a thing of, let me just put my conversations out there. But when you start reading the comments that people leave on your videos and giving you tips or wondering why you said this or criticizing you about something that you said or did, I early on decided that I was going to try to read almost every comment because a lot mm. of people turn off their comments or they don't read the comments mm -hmm. or people oh, never read the comments. Yeah. I read them and I, you know, I was you very respond so I, many times. Yeah. But most of the comments were very useful and and helpful. Yeah. I guess that's the same word. They were extremely helpful. They they helped me realize where I needed to improve on possibly. Mm -hmm. And some some of it was garbage. Yeah. But it also helped to toughen my skin too. Yeah. Yeah. That's so interesting. Okay. So you're you're that that sounds like tribe building or community building because you're you're posting these videos up on YouTube. At first it's just to have them posted somewhere but then you're slowly starting to get feedback and you're honing your craft, getting almost some crowdsourced feedback. And then you're slowly starting to gain a little bit of a following. Sure. So you're building a community. That's what Did happened. you have a way to communicate with the community other than through comments on YouTube? Like, you know, I guess now there's discord, but like back Dis then discord's huge. Now in the five years or so ago, it was a Facebook group and it's still out there. It's a street epistemology study group. There's probably 6,000 people in the group. So you started a Facebook group to accompany the YouTube videos. Somebody else actually started it. Oh, so I was very, I members. went there. Oh, there's a hundred people in this group. How cool. This, what is the street epistemology thing? They started it kind of without your consent. It, it was like, it's not my thing. Uh -huh. I stumbled across, I, okay. somebody created this yeah. group and I was excited yeah. to be a part of it. And I became an administrator, started uploading videos and 
then I noticed other people were uploading videos too. And it started this kind of groundswell of people from around the world initiating talks, putting their videos on YouTube. And what was... Would you upload to your, to your channel or... They were just uploading the t to their channels, but okay. we would notice those, those okay. same tags and those same titles. Oh. Yeah. So in the community, it wouldn't just be you posting your videos. Other right. people started posting theirs. Right. And there'd be these extensive conversations of everybody analyzing everybody's videos. Pretty much. Right? Pretty yeah. much. To like the last year I started doing it, I was going out. So this has evolved over the years for myself personally. When I first went out, it was one camera. Uh, yeah, I'd noticed The that. last year, there's three camera angles. I How have a, are you doing that? I'm live broadcasting the audio to Discord so people can listen in real time. Live? What? Yeah. Well, people wanted to see what, what is happening in the meantime. How hard is it for you to find somebody to stop and talk with you? Or why are you only posting that video? Where are your other videos? It was, it was in many ways to appease some of the skepticism about what people were seeing. Because I don't think a lot of people maybe believed that you can have such a good talk with a stranger in a, mm -hmm. in a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a novelty. It was a novelty. Maybe it even still is to see stuff like that. How do you, do you have multiple camera operators or? No, no. I just go out, have three GoPros and I just place them. I hit record and then. And then you, do you edit in yeah, post-production? I edit. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I hate, I hate video editing. Oh, I, I don't do it. I despise it. Yeah. That's why I do long form. Cause I, I, it's not sustainable for me. Yeah. Okay. So as this is growing, when does it go from just you posting some videos and having this Facebook group to where you start getting broader recognition? Well, early on, how did it grow? We had some allies, I suppose, in the atheist community where they were posting some of our videos. I, I remember uh, Richard Dawkins Foundation had a page on Facebook. They might even still do, and they shared one of my videos. I don't know even know how it originated. Who, if somebody stumbled across it or what? And a thousand comments underneath the video, and almost all of them were this is horrible. What is he doing? This really? is, this is evangelism for atheism. I was shocked. I was shocked at the response from atheists who were observing the SE thing, which today I don't think that stigma is there. I think, I think we've been working hard enough on it to explain it at what we're doing where the majority of atheists, I think understand what's happening here and they, they don't see it as the equivalent of a street preacher yelling at people. Yeah. Well, hopefully that's not the case. You but still have first, a few holdouts. There's still a few people who are like, what are you guys doing? But was that the first time you kind of really got a big, big eyeballs? Like, yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. I had, oh wow, 500 uh, views on my video. That was a really big moment. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not a lot today. So for years, there were just, you had hundreds of views. Yeah. For years, it just hobbled along. I know Hemant Meta every year or so. Would, I know Hemant. Hemant's a great person. Yeah. I love that guy. I love him. He would friendly atheist. He would share videos. Shout out to Hammett. Will you add that to the show notes, Kara? So if, if I had a, a good conversation that that stood out in some way, I would message Hammett like, "Hey, you know, check this out. What do you think?" Like, you met him at one of the conferences. He ended ended up coming to San Antonio and speaking right about the time that I was getting into SE. Okay. Yeah. At at what? It was a group called Fact. Uh, what is it? Free Thinkers and Atheists of Central Texas. Fine. I think it's something like that. I don't think that that's exactly. He's kind right. of an atheist celebrity, right? He, he is. Yeah. 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 So I was just tickled. And, you know, you notice your subscriber count jump and you notice people coming to the groups more. And because he gave you a shout out or. Yeah. He made a little post on his, on his blog. Friendly. Is he still blogging? Is he oh, still yeah. doing his thing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's still prolific. And other atheists were coming into these SC communities and learning how to do it and stumbling forward along with me you know we were all sort of learning this process and i think we've refined it drastically since those early days did you start putting together like a manual of how to do it like instructions like to do's and not to do's or like instruction videos I, i've seen some instruction videos mm -hmm. there's a real hunger for that so we ended up creating what we called the street epistemology guide which is on the se the street epistemology youtube channel i'm okay. oh, sorry the street epistemology website under resources. It's a PDF? It's a PDF. It's a little bit dated now. Okay. We're in the process now of designing a whole new self-directed course on it. But to back back then, it was this PDF, which is, I don't know, 40 pages long. And then I started uploading some, I would call them tutorial videos, where I wanted to actually teach people how to do this. And I 
just sat on my front lawn and put a camera on and just started talking and breaking down a video, like talking about a conversation that I had and why I was doing it in that way. So you started training other people. I wanted to teach people. I still want to teach people how to do this. Fun. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you create the manual, you start creating some training videos and training other people. Right. And then were there any other really big kind of moments that really Hmm. drove a lot of, drove your subscriber base forward? Did you ever get like featured on TV or like an important podcast? Did you ever get to meet Dawkins or Hitchens or Harris? Actually, I had Did dinner. Joe Rogan ever have you on? Like Not, the, not Joe Rogan. Of- not Joe Rogan. But he is in Austin and I am in San Antonio, so maybe one day. But I ended up going and meeting Dawkins for dinner. He was coming through Austin once. You met him? Yeah, we had dinner. Uh, it was one of those you pay $500 for a plate and it was a birthday present for me or something from, from my family. And I remember, or this was early on. This is when I was still arguing with street preachers, but I was trying to do street epistemology, and and uh, I was talking to Dawkins, and I was explaining what I do. That I'm trying to do this thing from Bogosian called street epistemology, and I'm going out and talking to street preachers, but it's not really going so well. I'm still arguing with them, and but I'm really trying to do better. And he got really excited and waved one of his handlers over, and. He said, this man harasses street preachers. <laughs> he was really excited. I said, well, it's not exactly that. And I spent a good five or 10 minutes telling him what we do. And I didn't really know what to expect, but I noticed he started following me on Twitter a week or so after that and nice. has been since. So, um, But it's interesting. I don't see people of that caliber using this approach much. Mm-hmm. They tend to still do the arguing and the debating it makes, it, bat- better, it makes better eyeballs, it, you know, it, it makes prob- better. It's entertaining. It's probably yeah. more entertaining to see a, a, a hostile debate going on, but it's a little dis- disappointing that maybe people that see the value of it don't speak to the value of it for, for whatever reason. I'm not sure. I don't hold any, you know, they can do whatever they want, but it's always been kind of a mystery to me. Why I'm thinking of that, that a variety show or whatever, where like Brandon flowers from the killers is being interviewed by, I think it was Dawkins and that was kind of really, it's kind of famous. It was kind of famous in our world because oh, really? I, I think Dawkins kind of body slams him and it, you know, and it, Carrie, you're nodding. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Brendan Flowers got really uncomfortable <laughs> and he's just, you know, like, that's your opinion, man. You know, that kind of attitude. <laughs> this is about evolution and yeah, and Mormonism. It was Dawkins calling like Joseph Smith was a fraud. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, how can anyone believe this? <laughs> and that, that kind of, and it made good, it made good rounds, of course, right? And Theater that, the, makes good rounds. That, I love that stuff too. When I was, <laughs> when I was observing it, the problem is that people who observe it attempt to mimic it with their loved ones. And well, that's where the problems can happen. Brandon Flowers is still a believer. Like I'm, I'm, you know, have, we have mutual friends and he's still an Orthodox probably. I mean, you're embarrassed on global television about your chair, deeply held cherished beliefs. Right. And you have close family and friends that are, that's probably going to create the backfire effect where you cling even more tightly Yeah. versus if you're treated respectfully and thoughtfully. So I really like what you're saying that some of the people that maybe value street epistemology in their opportunities for public exposure mm-hmm. don't seize it. And sometimes maybe to the detriment of the cause. I think so. I think that's possible. Yeah. I think that that approach could really set us back and it probably has set us back. Yeah, because atheism, the new atheism got a really bad rap, right? Yeah. Like, it, it it basically turned off a lot of people. It did, because of that aggressive approach. I mean, there there are literally videos, I think, of Dawkins maybe at a, at a rally in D.C. saying something along the lines of, we need to ridicule people who hold these beliefs, I think. Now, he may have switched it more to, we need to ridicule beliefs and not people. I'm not exactly sure. But there's still that there's still that issue with people being very aggressive. And sometimes I wonder if uh, maybe maybe some people are just incapable of of taking egos out of it and being calm when somebody says something that's wrong or insulting to you for the purpose of the conversation. Because you can learn street epistemology. You can learn to ask questions. You can learn to be reflective and bounce things back and dig deeper and deeper to the foundation of that Jenga tower, right? Like we talked about. But if you don't have the right mindset for it, if you can't control your anger and all this other stuff, you're going to really struggle with it. 
Because SE is far more than just asking really good questions. It's establishing that relationship and trust and the, the collaborative mindset of working together to get down to the bottom of what's propping it up. Yeah. And if you don't have that, like if you, if, if my conversation partner is uneasy to the point where they're being guarded, it's going to be a problem. And maybe there are just some people that, that just, they struggle with and they can't, it's a personality trait that they can't overcome. But the beauty, the thing that I do like is that there are people who will admit that that's the case with them, but they still see the value in what we're doing with SE yeah. and they want to support us. That's and, good. And that's great. Yeah. And I'm going to just apologize ahead of time. I care really wants to get into the actual street epistemology. <laughs> I, because I've, because I've, I don't meet a lot of people. I don't get to talk to a lot of people who have built platforms and have built movements. So I'm as interested in that as I am in street epistemology. So she's going to hate me later. But I'm going to keep on this. I, I'm, 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 well, please do, because I love the detail that you're going into, because I don't think I've ever gotten so granular on this stuff. And that's awesome. And we have, and we do have tomorrow. Carrie, yeah. you're, you're I, I'm just thinking back to when I was obsessed and watching all of your videos. And I would have loved to click on a long format Mormon Stories type interview with Anthony Magnabosco. <laughs> so this is for me. Like, you know, a couple of years ago when I was diving into this stuff. So I'm sure that's going to be popular with people okay, on okay. YouTube who want to hear who the guy is, you know, well. get into the real story, how you, how you built this, where you came from. So I'm, I don't hate you, John. I okay, never, okay. Could, never would. Okay. Building up to it, I guess. So as you're, as this starts really taking off, you start getting, uh, mentions and links from other people. And as you're trying to keep your day job, which I assume you, you, you still have your day job even now. Is that right or not? Or no, actually I've been a stay at home dad since 2012 when I shut my, my repair business down. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay. So when this was really taken off, you were a stay at home dad. That's right. So oh. I, I had a lot of time on the side to be able to edit videos and go out and record a couple talks and I maybe do a presentation. I love this. I had no idea. Yeah, I'm very fortunate. Okay. So when this took off, you were a stay at home dad. Yes. Okay. So, okay, then I have a different, and Kara's going to relate to this because Kara is kind of, I don't want to speak for you, but Kara's trying to figure out how to balance being a former stay-at-home mom with now being a working mom, but a part-time stay-at-home mom and having a husband that's a stay-at-home dad uh, for okay. now. Yeah. Like, okay, so as this is taking off and you're a stay-at-home dad and, mm -hmm. you're, and your wife is working a lot and it's start, you start to have to, you know, you're reading people's responses on YouTube and you're seeing the people are blogging and you're probably getting emails and preparing, reading all the Facebook. Preparing talks and getting how, interviews. How in the world are you balancing this with raising kids and keeping your spouse happy and all the to-dos that that you've got? And Was how that, many kids do you have? And I don't know how if, old were they? I mean, I, you I, don't have, I, hopefully they are happy and right. it, that's all turned out. I mean, I've I do try to, like, that is a very big priority for me, for sure. My family is huge. Uh, however, like, this is very big for me, too, because I see the, 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 the potential of it. So it's been kind of tough balancing it all, to be honest. So it was hard. That's what, I, I, that's what I'm trying yeah. to get. I didn't mean to say that you did a perfect job. <laughs> it's more to say it must have been really hard to load balance. True? A little bit. Um it's really not that hard. I mean, okay. cause they would so go no. to school. Like I throw a load in the laundry and I sit down to edit a video. So like I was able to, you know, <laughs> and to this day I'm folding clothes, maybe while I'm listening to the replay of something that I, that I did. All right. So I, I sound familiar, Kara. I, well, I was just curious if you had like <laughs> little kids at home, but they were in school and, or back then they were in middle school, maybe okay. just starting high school. And now they're transitioning into college, which I think is going to free me up for more stuff like this. Okay. So yeah, in Kara's case, I mean, in my case, my kids were definitely in middle school and high school, mm. but I was the primary breadwinner in Kara's case. Her kids are still younger. So my kids are still taking crap out of the drawers every moment of the day and just my house is still chaos because oh, my really? kids are still really young so all this balancing of trying to be part of something bigger you know and having all of your brain power kind of devoted to something that work doesn't shut off at a certain time like that's that's kind of a hard frustrating situation very fr i can relate to that because even even now there's there's so many things that i want to do and sometimes i, I get mad at my situation because like oh, I, I want to sit down and edit that video or talk to that person or whatever but there's this mundane household task that needs to be done. And I'm like, why am I doing laundry right now? I should be, you know, th this is not the best use of my time. So it is frustrating, but I just, 
deal with it, I guess. I stay up late. I'm kind of a night owl also. I, I might be up till one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning doing some things. And yeah. There's also the intellectual and emotional uh, expenditure. So there's one thing yeah. to have time, but sometimes debates and tension and conflict, and there's probably haters out there. Mm -hmm. That can, even if you've got time to, while you're folding the laundry, you know, to do stuff and all the other chores you probably did, there's still the emotional and the cognitive load because you still being a stay at home dad. I mean, if that's, it's gotta be analogous to being a stay at home mom and that's super brutal. So did you ever find it intellectually or emotionally draining to make it so it was harder to be the dad, stay at home dad you wanted to be? A little bit. So sometimes there might be a comment on a video that rattled me, or maybe mm -hmm. I actually had an interview that day where somebody said something that I was, I was taken aback because they shared something I would never imagine a stranger would share with another stranger, but they did. Mm -hmm. So I started learning to try to, as best I could, to leave that stuff in the field and not take it home with me. But it, it was still difficult to, to, um, to just put that on the back burner. So sometimes there were things where I was processing a, a challenge or a difficult situation or something that happened earlier in the day. And then you have this kind of mundane task right in front of you. And it's a little frustrating to to not be able to put your mind to it and settle it before you can move on to the easier stuff. Mm -hmm. That was a little frustrating. Was, was there ever a pressure for you to use your time and energy to provide additional income for the family or was that just never a real pressure? Fortunately, my, my wife has a really good job. So, so it, it's, it, she covered, she had a cover. We got it covered. Okay. Okay. Which is, yeah. So you haven't had to deal with intense financial pressures as a part so of far, building no, what, you, what you did. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Okay, good. That was a huge question I had about like fundraising and donors and yeah, all it wasn't that really stuff. an issue. If I need a new camera, you know, wait a couple months, save up some money, and go get it. It wasn't a big deal. Did you put up a PayPal button or a you know? Did you ever start soliciting donations from I, listeners? At I some never point? did. Although within the last year or so, so two years ago, we started a nonprofit organization. Called Why did you start that? Because we wanted to get funding for people to study what we're doing to see if it works. Is it harming people? And when you say we, who's we? Other people who are interested in street epistemology. You just got like a posse of... There's of, a posse. Of just... <laughs> there's a apostles. world... Apostles? There's a worldwide... Are there 12 apostles? There's way more than 12. <laughs> but. I can tell you, if I wasn't doing this, I'd be in that posse, like hardcore. It's, I used to be in a lot more of those Facebook groups and on Reddit and stuff, oh yeah? reading all of that stuff, watching all the videos. Uh, we'd love to have you on one of the one of the review shows that we do. Oh, if okay. you're interested, we could do we do a breakdown. In fact, they're doing Kara's a breakdown great. video. I mentioned that somebody's uh, reviewing one of my videos of the Mormons. Kara is delightful. She's funny. She's smart. She's witty. You'll love having her. Oh, yeah. Uh, for sure. That'd be cool. Yeah. Love she, to have you aboard. She needs that. She'll... You'll, you'll be great. You'll be I feel like I wanted to answer something more about that. What was the question? So you've got this posse, your team of a lot of people. Do you have like a core kind of group of like leaders or? Well, hmm. I mean, we started the nonprofit in like two years ago. So there's a core group. There's there's a board of directors and we're bringing other people on. And then there's. What's it called? It's called Street Epistemology International. Okay. So uh, because this isn't just a U.S. thing, it's it's worldwide. And there are, there's a hardcore group of people, I guess, who usually haunt some of the different online SE communities. You know, you, you go to Discord and they always seem to be there, that type of thing, mm -hmm. which is good because there's always new people filtering in and there's, it's nice to have some, uh, some people to kind of guide them through. What made you incorporate Discord when Facebook was serving your needs? I, I, we don't even use Discord on Mormon Stories and it's probably a huge oversight I think Midnight Mormons even use Discord. Like, mm -hmm. what made you incorporate Discord, and how is it used? I think somebody just started. A, it was very, very similar to the Facebook groups. Somebody created a page or a group on Discord called Street Epistemology. They created a server called Street Epistemology. I joined it. They didn't ask your permission. They're like, I'm doing they don't this. need my permission. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't own the term or anything like that. Yeah. You know, this This came up in the book back in 2013, and we've just been running with it. So, uh, so yeah, they started the group. I joined it. They asked me if I wanted to be a moderator. I'm like, no way you guys do whatever you need to do. Uh, but it was cool because I was seeing functionality on that platform that worked really good. Like I could put an, an AirPod in my ear and stream the audio while people from around the world were listening in on that discord server. That is something that you really can't do on Facebook as far as I'm aware. So streaming audio yes. to a live audience, it's right. kind of like 
YouTube or Facebook live, yeah. but audio only. Which is actually a step back from what I was doing. Uh, a year before Discord, I was going out and doing Periscope with my cell phone. So I was, I was actually, I remember Periscope. Remember that? That's Twitter, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, Twitter bought it. I yeah. think. So I was like live streaming the video to my, to Periscope while simultaneously recording it on my GoPro. And that was kind of cool for a while, but it was so tech heavy. Uh -huh. It was just easier to stream the audio to discord and then just keep my camera going. Kara, have you ever been into discord? Um, I tried and I needed to watch a tutorial on it or something. I'm pretty <laughs> intuitive. Those things. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's I've been on it for three years and I still don't like the navigation on it. It's goofy. Yeah, it's weird. Does your server have like a number of subscribers? Yeah, I think so. Is it like a th thousand, a hundred, no, ten thousand? Like it's not a hundred ten. No, there's maybe five thousand there. Five thousand, something like that. That's a great. That's a great base. It's pretty good. The, there's a Reddit page for street epistemology that has eleven thousand, twelve thousand people. Um, we'll add links. We'll add links to all that. Yeah, oh, we've, we've got a link tree link that has links to everything, so we could just give you one link and yeah. Okay. Link tree and then street epistemology, I think. Okay. So you would, so as you're, when you're going out, it's like, hey, everyone, I'm going out Friday at 10 o'clock. Right. And I'll be, do you live stream? You don't, you don't ever live stream because you've got multiple cameras and you have to do the editing and post production. I would live stream the audio and I'd have three cameras going. But prior and to. And people going, just sit and listen? Yeah. To like people coming and people coming and people coming. Because what would happen is, as I'm live streaming, let's say I'm having a conversation, people would be listening and then typing what they were hearing, like, oh, good question, or "or uh, she seems kind of weird, or, you know, they, they would comment on whoever I'm speaking with. And you probably can't observe the discard, mm, the discard it was text, commentary but while in between, you're... Yeah, not not in the moment, but as they were walking, as my interviewee was walking away, I'd pull up my phone and, oh, okay, yeah, that was, you know, I, I could actually comment on what they were saying, and... That was good. Okay, so while you're waiting for people between mm -hmm. people, you would go ch you check Discord and right. see what the what the communities say, and they could even unmute their microphones and talk to me too. Oh, and talk back and give you tips and suggestions yeah. and feedback. So there, yeah, I got a lot. I'm quitting. Of that. I got to go on the Discord. It was <laughs> it was great. Um, there are still some people that do. They do it with video now. There's a really cool channel called Cordial Curiosity. Well, I'm, I mean, is, I'm just, I'm thinking about now it's YouTube and Facebook and we do something similar. Yeah. We just live stream and then people comment on the video. Yeah. You might as well just stream the audio out to, to a discord or something if you wanted to. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. See, I, that's I, this is I, when DC and Marvel. It might up. be a headache though. Tips. I'm just, get, I'm get a good moderator, crime. get a good moderator. Cause yeah. there's all that drama that happens and. We made a decision. We didn't want the, our, our, our nonprofit organization to be involved in managing groups and that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. So we just let, those are all fan managed platforms that we happen to stream to occasionally and, and go to. So this is a total uh, sidetrack, but did you mention at some point kind of drama in the atheist kind of communities? That well, there's, there's drama. I mean, yeah, there's, there's, Okay, I think we're, we're talking in the context of more of the aggressive, in your face, the four horsemen style, as opposed to maybe. I think softer I'm. Refer, I think I'm. Refer, something I may have read that you wrote previously, or maybe some conversation we had, but like, I guess I'm saying there there was this era where, whether it's Penn and Teller or Bill Maher or Hitchens, Dawkins, and Harris and Hemant, yeah. where like it seemed like there were these conferences every year that people would go to. Mm -hmm. And there were big deals. And then I don't know if I remember like accusations of like harassment or whatever. Like, I don't know if I, but, but it was weird. I was never a part of any of that. Somehow Mormons are so freaking isolated. I'm guessing there were ex Mormons there, but yes. like to so many of us, we just kind of keep to ourselves and build our own stuff. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know, like we're not plugged in. Like just now I'm getting plugged in with like, um, you know, ex Jehovah's Witnesses and ex Scientologists like Leah Remini and Mike uh -huh. Rinder, yep. or um, uh, J you know, J JT and Lady C, the ex Jehovah's Witnesses, um, Chris Shelton, mm -hmm. um, Lloyd, and Lloyd, uh, Lloyd, Lloyd Evans, Lloyd Evans. Yeah, just in the past couple of years, have I even found out about them? Really? But there's yeah, but but I guess I'm wondering, is there a vibrant? atheistic community and is it still vibrant and like what are the main are you a part of it or do you know anything about it or is that not really your your thing i would say i am a part of the atheist community but it does seem lately that it's 
diminished. Was that COVID or something else? Probably COVID is part of it. It's, it seems like there's, there's little barrier to starting your own YouTube channel. So there's hundreds of atheist themed YouTube channels these days. So maybe they've, they've kind of carved the market up where maybe in, in the past, maybe there were like four or five big people, big names that would do it. And now there's probably 500, which I don't know if that's necessarily a bad thing. There's okay. still drama though. Like there's, we still have our, our moments of drama as, as imagine you guys do in your communities. Are there like leaders of the atheist community that are like active leaders? Like, Avengers, you know, like Iron Man and Spider Man. Do you do? The, does the atheist community have equivalents of kind of? Well, like- yeah, I would say like uh, Matt Dillahunty might be a really big name in the atheist community. Have you heard of Matt Dillahunty? Yeah. Okay, I was going to say. Don't know anything if, about him. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Kara's nodding. Sarah so, identi- Kara identifies as atheist. I don't. Oh yeah. But not because oh, I'm really? necessarily a believer. Yeah. I just don't like the term. The term. Okay. Yeah, we talk a lot about like labels can be kind of harmful sometimes. And so I I get that understanding and stuff, but it is the quickest way to explain just as a non-religion. I'm not a theist. I don't worship any God. The end, you know, it's a quicker term, but John likes to add a little more nuance more than I. I just don't like the the term. I don't like that. I don't, this isn't a, I I just don't like that. It's going to turn people off just like debating and and arguing is Mm going to turn people off. For me in Mormonism, if you label yourself an atheist for Orthodox Mormons and probably even semi-believing Mormons, they're going to just shut right yeah. off. So it's probably safer to I, say I'm I'm not sure if I believe or not, or I don't really I'm not religious. You unorthodox get or you know yeah, yeah I don't know. I'm kind of torn on it because I I can see the benefit of identifying consistently. Like if we all identified as one group, like yeah. there's some advantages to that. Taking away stigma, popularizing yeah. the term, right. Right. Uh, maybe politicians seeing us as a voting block and taking us seriously if we yeah. were all on these in the same label. Yeah. But yeah, when you drop the atheist <laughs> label, I've seen it. I, I even see it to this day. Oh. People become closed. closed you they, may as they, well eat babies. Yeah. For, I mean, in terms of public opinion and like yeah. popularity, you yeah. try running for office in the United States as an open atheist. Yeah. Forget it. The thing is, though, despite that, I still don't mind identifying yeah. as one oh, because yeah. I want people to know. Totally that, oh, my neighbor doesn't believe in any God and he seems like a nice person and he loves his kids and keeps up on his lawn. I totally see it. And I, I feel a little bit of guilt, but I just want to be effective in my community. Yeah. And I just haven't seen the utility yet in adopting that identity. I do. <laughs> I hear you. Being yeah. a Provo girl with blonde hair and uh, <laughs> fake tan skin. I'm like, I'm not Mormon. I'm actually an atheist. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Yeah. Okay. So Matt Dillahunty, is that... Matt Dillhunty. Yeah, Matt Dill. Yeah, yeah, he's a pretty big name with the atheist community of Austin, and they have a show called The Atheist Experience and several other shows. Uh, he's probably the biggest name at the moment. Hemant. Seth Andrews, Hemant Meta. Jimmy Snow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, Jimmy's ex Mormon. Jimmy's ex Mormon. Have you met? Have you met Jimmy? I've been on a show. Oh, cool. A while ago. Oh, yeah. good. Yeah. Okay. Any other big names or big channels or? <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot. No, that's okay. A cosmic yeah. skeptic is probably a big one that's out there. Although he kind of dabbles more into debates and he's very into veganism. Uh, Rationality rules might be a big channel that's out there. You know, I don't really consume a lot of content. I'm usually making content. Yeah, I or, get that. Or developing <laughs> I get material. That. That's you know? kind of, I'm cursed by that too. Is there a skeptics guide to the universe podcast or something? There is. Is that out of England? I don't think so. I've got a friend, Jerry. I got a friend. Hey, shout out to Jerry um, Johnson, who's a huge fan. So I I think that's the name of the podcast, my friend. Yeah, I think I have it on my podcast episode thing, but I haven't listened to it in a while. Okay, okay. I've just been busy with other stuff. Okay, so I'm almost done with kind of this line of questioning. Um, (laughs) Okay, so what have been the biggest channels or media exposure, like, you know, what have been kind of your, the pinnacles of, of opportunities or miles or exposures in terms of like people giving you visibility, like good morning America or like yeah. CNN or like, no, have you ever been picked up? I haven't hit any of those milestones yet, which is, it, it feels like it's just around the corner, mm-hmm. but we're just not there yet. Okay. So uh, 
I, I guess like when I first started, it was just just posting my video on a Facebook group and getting feedback was huge. And yeah. then when Hemet Meta made a post or two about it, it was great. Seth Andrews invited me on a couple of times to talk about SE and playing video examples, so that helped. I've been giving, I've given countless talks. There's a link on my website. So you started getting invited to getting speak at conferences, yes, and conferences, presentations. Do you do that workshops. a lot? I do, but I'm really scaling it back. It's it's become too much. Why? What, what was that like? So you started tra- well, at, the, at the peak. How often were you giving speeches? At the peak, speeches uh, online a month. and in person. Yeah. I would say forty a year, something like that. So basically, once a week is a lot. You were either doing something online or right. traveling somewhere. Yes, and then you have to arrange for the kids to be taken care of yeah. or to cover your duties. Exactly. And- yeah, so being a road tough. warrior for me, it just blows. I, I yeah, it. I don't really miss it that much. Yeah, this is kind of nice though. This is my second trip this year. I we think. really appreciate it. No, it's awesome. I'm glad that we, because I, like I said, I was here earlier in the year and we, I was trying to get away from the family to do it, but it just didn't work out. And then we circled back and now we're doing it today. It's awesome. Okay, so the types of conferences you would be invited to would be what? Well, I've spoken to the American Atheist Conference uh, twice. Maybe three times I've given workshops there. I've spoken at humanist groups and like local, yeah, city based. You ever hear of Oasis and those types of things? Like the one in, in Wichita? It's like Sunday Assembly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, Sunday I, I've Assembly. Been there. They took me there. Okay. Yeah. So groups like that. Uh, lots of online things. Uh, Did you meet Helen? Channels. Was it Helen? Is that, uh, when'd you go to, when'd you go to Oasis? Well, I've gone Kansas to like, city I've Oasis. Like, Kansas City Oasis? Yeah. Oh, it was two years ago, I think. Okay, yeah. Daryl Ray, do you know Daryl? Yeah, he yeah, yeah, Daryl. Yeah. So and there's a list of all the talks I've given okay. on okay. my on my website, but it's quite a few. Okay. Yeah. Fun. Yeah, it's usually like bigger podcasts. Like, so it was really cool. I think at one point I was interviewed by David Packman. That was awesome. So it, it seems like there's there's um, some interest from news about what we're doing, but we're just not quite there yet. And I don't know what might be holding us back. I'm thinking the Isn't associ- it hard when you want to break and you like, don't know how to break through. I, I'm thinking that maybe it's the associate association with atheism or something along those mm-hmm. lines. But oh, it's huge. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so so as as it's transitioned from just a youtube channel and a facebook group and then the discord thing then you started the nonprofit how has it evolved and kind of where are you looking for it to go what are you hoping it to become well at the moment we are structuring the board in a way where we have enough people to do the work that is available to do uh, the other part of that is getting the website up to snuff and actually coming up with some products, some some things that people can be using to learn SE to help fund our ventures. Ultimately, we want to be able to test what we're doing and find people who are interested in the scientific aspect of this communication approach. Is it better than debate? Like, what are the long-term results of this? Could we track several dozen people over the course of a year wouldn't that be cool to see that journey? So that's really what, what we're trying to shift to is is uh, put the infrastructure in place so that we can get some money to test this, uh, but also fund other people to promote it too. Because at the moment, people who are interested in SE, they're strictly volunteers who are doing it. Uh, this is all coming out of their own pocket. But now, we're at the point now where we're able to purchase equipment for people. If somebody wants to go out and get a camera or edit videos, uh, there's a couple of hoops that they have to jump through in order to do it, but we have funds now to to cover that type of stuff, which is great. So how, so, so your nonprofit is how are you generating revenue now? At the moment, it's all through donations, like a PayPal button or PayPal what? button. Where, or where Patreon? Are you? Okay, yeah, Patreon. Mm-hmm. Do you and it's for every video you put out. You you pay. Oh yeah, that reminded me. I actually started monetizing my own videos through we, ads through ads and all that money goes to the nonprofit. So I I don't make any money from it, but uh, that's how we get our money at the moment. Yeah. So the primary source of revenue for your nonprofit is YouTube ads. YouTube. No, that's probably third. We have some donors that have contributed over the years that like what we're doing and then want to see us succeed. So we get a generous donor that sends us a nice check. That's awesome. That helps. 
Uh, the second part of that is just the, your every, every average day person who maybe can contribute 10 bucks a month, that type of thing. So you have people just sign up and that's where we get most of our revenue, yeah. just monthly yeah. donations. And then probably the YouTube thing is maybe third on that list. But uh, Sounds like you haven't been really aggressive about fundraising. No, because we're, we're still just laying the groundwork for this. And you know we're kind of going slow uh, and methodically. You know? So I, I'm going to ask you a hard question. Um, Go for it. So I had to do this as a primary breadwinner. So for me, I had to build an organization that could support me and my family at first. Mm. And then if I could grow it well enough, I could help support other people's families with, with, with positions. But yeah, I, I had to make it um, sustainable that way from the very start. Yeah. And so, um, but my hard question to you is why aren't you getting paid? Because I have seen, like, I'm even more impressed now than before. And I was impressed before, but the fact that you've been doing all of this and that you've been able to be so, so successful and there's been almost no monetary benefit to you at all. And that you haven't quit. Like <laughs> my biggest thing is you see people coming into the ex Mormon space or the progressive Mormon space wanting to make a difference. And they're just so often a flash in the pan because they start something, they'll start a podcast, they'll start a YouTube channel, yeah. but then it's busy and, and criticism and comments and having a constant flow of content. People just burn out and they go away. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually not, even though I love the altruism and I did it for five or six years mm -hmm. making nothing. Um, so, I mean, I get that too, and I did that too, but at some point I'm like, I either have to make a living off of this or go to something else. Yeah. And so I'm a huge fan of sustainability. And so I actually think leaders of this type of thing, it, it'll have a chance of being more successful and of lasting longer if the, if the people are getting paid. Now, I'm sure some of my listeners are like, I hate you, John, but that's, that's, yeah. that's, my, that's what I've learned. What, what's your response? Why don't you draw a salary? Well, number one, I don't need to. Okay. I, I don't need to have another source of income. So that okay. was probably the primary thing. And I want to see this thing succeed. Yeah. It's not just my thing. Yeah. Like this is a tool that we want everyone to learn. So that really was just kind of sec secondary. I just wanted to see the, the or I want to see the organization succeed and I want to see this method propagate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's it. Like all, but you're right. We do need money to make this thing work. And we'll probably reach the point at, at some stage where we'll need to start paying people. In fact, we're actually quickly reaching it. You have no we're, paid staff right now? None. Okay. No, it's all volunteer based. But uh, that's so cool. You can, if you work with volunteers before, you know what it's like. It's, well, it's brutal. They, well, they start out very strong case. and then they ghost you or that totally, type of stuff, right? all the time. Yeah. How have you done that? How have you harnessed volunteers to actually get stuff done? Well, that's a good, I don't know if I have the right, a good answer to that because some, yeah. some people stick it out because they see the, they, they're, they find it rewarding and they, they love it. Others get burned out for whatever reason. How do you, how do you maintain those people? I mean, I guess just treat them nice and try not to overwhelm them and ask, ask them frequently if they are getting overwhelmed. That's probably the best that you can do. But it's also, there's the idea of quality control. And of course, I don't want you to throw your volunteers under the bus or even <laughs> alienate or criticize them in any way. But I mean, there's a real high quality to what you do, in my opinion. I mean, like I'm not gonna, I don't wanna embarrass Kara, but she views you intellectually as a heavyweight. And I do too. Are you, are you blushing, probably, Kara? Why does he keep saying this? Um, <clears throat> no, but I mean, there's a super high quality to what you do. And I imagine it, um, there's a real intellectual rigor to what you do. And it, it takes a lot of restraint to practice street epistemology effectively. Mm -hmm. And so I imagine that having volunteers try and participate, you're going to get a varying level of, of quality. Well, it depends on where they're helping out. So yeah. for example, we're working on this self-directed course where we've identified special certain topics that we want to see in this course and we've structured them. We have a team of a dozen people from around the world working on this thing and they've been working on it for a year. A now, dozen people. Yeah. Now people come and go and we have to replace it, but people have been sticking it out. Is it like a multimedia platform? We ha it? We're actually communicating on, well, 
it's eventually going to be on the street epistemology website where you'll be able to go and pull up module one and go through it and take it and do all the stuff. Like but with animations, with video, just audio, just written text with some illustrations at the moment. Okay. Yeah. That's great. Very simple. Yeah. Is the curriculum all formulated or are you still working on the We curriculum? are about a, th we're almost a third of the way done with the course. Wow. It's going to be about 21 modules, each module about 30 pages long. It's going to are be you the primary intense. author or? No, uh, we have subject matter experts who are, they are pros with street epistemology and they're all taking different modules. Uh, but we tag team too. So sometimes we'll have a team of three people review what the other person wrote to make sure that there is a decent quality there. And then we also uh, test, I don't know if you've, you've noticed this, but uh, whenever we have a module that comes, that's ready to go to the public, we actually have a, a few people from the community test it. We do focus group testing and make sure that it's good before we put it out there. Uh, but we're not as far along on that as, as I'd like to be. Maybe by the end of next year, maybe we'll have half the course done. Possibly. Wow, see? So, I mean, honestly, it's going to so, take you three, four, five, six years yeah. to create a course. Right. Oh. But what do you do? Like, yeah. we, we've, we've tried all different types of approaches, hiring people who are experts in writing, but if you don't know the subject, yeah. so we're kind of limited to the, the, the volunteers at the moment. Yeah. But we have to transition to a more stable pl platform and, and organizational structure you know, where there is money coming in. Yeah, we're 16 years in, and it wasn't until three or four or five years ago that we were able to start trying to think about staff and yeah. And we would love to have a staff of three or four people and, and just knock it out. Yeah. Well, you'll get there. Well, we're get getting there. a lot done. Yeah. yeah. Do you guys do grant grant proposals and we that have, type we of have, stuff? We've not done any grants. No. Really. Uh, we, we've got a couple that's, small ones. That's an area that we were going to probably head into is, is do some grant writing. Yeah. Well, I love that vision of trying to run scientific studies of the effectiveness yeah. of street epistemology uh, over time. That's We want to see this thing... You know, what is happening in a person's brain when they're thinking about their thoughts in the way that we do when we're using SE? Yeah. We want to see what's happening because it seems like something's happening. When when I'm engaging with somebody in that method and they're thinking, it's profound. It's profound to watch them do that. And they also later say, well, that was really fascinating. And I want to, I want to see what's happening in a person's brain. And how, how effective is this long term? Are people really thinking about it later and changing their mind on these things or not? Yeah. We've got to study it. Yeah. As I'm watching your videos, I'm thinking about that all the time. Like how really? much did they change, you know, right. by, by the end? Yeah. I started last year or two, I started encouraging people to come back for more than one talk. I don't know if you noticed, but I would offer them mm -hmm. some puzzle pieces yeah. and they would come back and that was neat, but it's still anecdotal. Yeah. It's still anecdotal experience. Yes. They're coming back for three or four talks, which is great. We're seeing, movement or we're talking about different topics or that type of thing. There's growth. Let's just put it that way. But uh, we need something a little bit more rigid than some video examples from du some dude in Texas. And it's usually in person is technically, but I've seen you do it online as well. So is that's a little bit easier to make sure that you can circle back with people online, right? I mean, it might be easier to circle back to a person that's online, but I think you lose a lot in the caliber of the conversation when you're doing it online as opposed to in person. That'd be my preference is like For to do sure. a video or face to face. Yeah. Okay. So with the, not, you've got a nonprofit, you got a board, mm -hmm. you are trying to build a course yep. and you're trying to get grants to do academic research. Yep. Anything else in your vision? We're revamping the website because we web redesign web redesign. Yeah. Yes. We want to have a very solid back end so that we can make the course available to people you know, in a really robust way and develop Is it WordPress products. WordPress site. We're, we're shopping around now uh, for a platform. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We actually thought about doing the website redesign with volunteers, but that was, I think that's the, this was the project that was the transition from let's use a whole bunch of volunteers for this to no, let's actually use the money that we've collected so far and actually hire somebody to do this for us. Totally. Yeah. It, you know, the nonprofit space, I found it to be really brutal, really hard. Um, but also we've, we've made an impact. So Hell yeah, you guys have Yeah, You've been around for a long time. You got this big event coming up on Sunday. Yeah. Thrive. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, I mean, that's why for me, like 
these are the things I think about all day long in separate from content. It's just like, how do you, but, but okay, let me just say this. You have had a fraction of the budget that I've had, I think, and way less time doing what you're doing. And you've got more, you've got a bigger, you've amassed a bigger following and you've been more effective. Like I'm just going to own that right now. You've got 70, 70,000 YouTube subscribers mm -hmm. and you said 5,000 on discord and a big yeah. robust Facebook group. And well, you're, you're more well-known than Mormon stories. So, I mean, you've done you, that. You've done a phenomenal job with, with, um, not much. Very little resources. That's <laughs> impressive. Well, I, I think the videos just speak for themselves, really. Like if you just watch the videos and you see what's happening, that sells it. Yeah. The other thing is that we're not just talking with people about religion or a specific religion like Mormonism. So SE is much more broad than that, which could be a reason why. Like, so we might have videos about exploring racism or transgender issues or things like that. So veganism these are topics vaccines will, vaccines have you been covering that yeah i just i just released a video where uh yeah where we covered that yeah 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 because because the, there are all sorts of problems in society mm -hmm. beyond religion right the, magical so, thinking so that probably or, explains why it's a little broad but i'm still i'm still kind of perplexed why it's not bigger isn't that frustrating yeah yeah and i don't know like I, I have my suspicions why that might be the case, you know, probably because of the origins of SE. Uh, maybe we just need to wait until the stigma of atheism goes away. I don't know. But the course that we're writing doesn't even mention atheism or God or religion or anything like that. It's, it's much broader in scope. Cause when I, when I originally asked you to come at some point, one of the times you had mentioned, oh, I'm trying to kind of get away. I don't know if that's you as a kind of leader or, mm -hmm. It seemed like you were basically saying there's some other guy that's doing more of the religious stuff. Like, <laughs> is that, did I get that right? Or So I'm a little torn. Me personally, I love speaking with people about their religious views because I think there are so many other views that they hold that are dependent on that one. And I think that your biggest bang for your buck, if you're going to engage with somebody, is to explore how they concluded that their religious views are true. Mm -hmm. So that's appealing to me. However as the executive director of this nonprofit, we're trying to broaden this tool out. We want to use this far beyond just religion. Yeah. And I'm, that's always at the back of my mind. If I do an interview like this with a high profile ex Mormon, who's had a <laughs> podcast since 2005, what, what is going to be the perception of that? Because uh, I do want to move SE into a broader culture but also, like, I also want to give people these tools. We're going to be probably be meeting a lot of ex-Mormons this coming weekend. Yeah. And they're likely going to be looking for ways to talk to their loved ones about these things. And I think that this is a really good solution. So I'm torn, you know, and you have a big reach too. So this is, this is a good reason to come out here and do this. Yeah, but it's tricky because... Yeah. Yeah, religion, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the term the third rail, like I learned it in D.C., like, you know, you, in, on, on the, I guess on the metro, yeah. there's the two rails that the train runs on, then the third rail provides the electricity, right? Am I getting this right? Yes. And if you so. touch that third rail, you die, basically. Right. Right. Like, religion and atheism is, is often that third rail where, like, oftentimes professors, like I, you know, I, I pursued a Ph.D., and a couple of master's degrees. And like so many of my advisors are like, I don't want to get anywhere near religion. I know, you know it's what I tough. Mean? It's tough. It, here's the challenge too, is that there are people who are in different disciplines. They're in, uh, they're in science communication or they're academics of some sort. And they're coming up, they're noticing the technique that we're using here with street epistemology and they see the value in it. Um, but I, I do wonder if they're still maybe holding back and not getting too involved in SE because of that. So that, yeah, I, I'd say, I'd say there's a, there's a significant effort to try to broaden SE out. Yeah. No, it's, that's, and it should, it should be broadened out. I think. Sure. For sure. Yeah. That's another, okay. So that's another focus you have. Well, we appreciate sure. you c coming here to work with us anyway, even though there's, it's fraught, it's complicated. Uh, it, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah. yeah, it's it's okay. I mean, if you invited us and 
we evaluate that and is, is this a, a group that we want to affiliate with and 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 of course this is me personally coming here i'm not necessarily representing the nonprofit, but yeah i mean i like what you guys are doing you're you're helping people who need it and a lot of people don't even need that know that they need this help you know they they just think oh this is this trauma that i'm going to deal with um you're offering solutions you're normalizing non-belief with a specific demographic uh, that's exciting for me to see. You know, that's going to really start changing things. You know, now that you mention it, um, now we're sort of switching a, a tiny. I mean, it's been a conversation all the way, but like, I'll just share with you something that that I've thought a lot about and we've thought about. Like when in 2005, when I'm like, what should the podcast format be? There's a lot of things you could do. You can you can monologue, right? You can have panels. You can interview experts. And in my case, I attended a digital storytelling conference as a part of a master's degree I got in instructional technology. Mm -hmm. And in that digital storytelling course that I took, they talked about the power of narrative, the power of story. That we kind of evolved, at, you know, um, around the campfire, mm -hmm. telling stories to each other. And that's how wisdom and beliefs and all laws all got kind of passed down. And so when I was thinking about the format for the podcast, I thought, well, how about stories? You know? So you went the epist street epistemology route. I kind of thought, how can I make the biggest change cause the biggest shift mm. in people? And for you, it was street epistemology. For me, it was storytelling because, and I'm sorry, I'm just, I hope this is interesting to you. This isn't no, me trying is. to, bring the attention back to me. This is me having a conversation with the fellow thought leader. If you can call us that a tiny bit to just talk about what works. And what I found is stories are super effective yeah. because, um, they captivate your interest and they pull your emotion mm -hmm. because people, if you've studied Jonathan Haidt at all, like the righteous mind, I'm sure you probably know it better than me. Oh yeah. He talks about the writer and the elephant. We have his book on our website uh, as a reference. For yeah. Sure. yeah. So it's the elephant that moves people. Emotion, the, the amygdala, is going to override the cerebral frontal cortex every time. Emotion is going to override intellect every time. The man is never going to override. If, if the elephant's scared and the writer is scared, who wins? The elephant wins. And so, and I learned this also uh, studying psychology doing psychotherapy is you could have an intellectual conversation with a client. Tell me this, tell me that answer these questions. You could have that dialogue, but if you could get them to feel, you could really cause a shift with the feeling. Mm -hmm. And so stories captivate people's attention. We have 13 hour stories on Mormon stories podcast. If you can believe that 13 hours, but there are people that listen to every hour. Not everyone, but a lot do. But more importantly, their captivate their attention is captivated. But then, when the when you if you can get people to the point in their story where they're talking about the way they were abused, or they're talking about losing, you know, getting separated or divorced from their spouse because their spouse uh, still believed and they lost their faith, and then how they were alienated from their children, or if you can get them talking about the way that they feel angry that they wasted 60 or 70 years of their life and 10% of their income and you get them to start tearing up or to express emotion or sadness or anger or joy. When you get them talking about how joyful it is to now like accept their gay child and to be able to love them instead of wanting, making their child want to kill themselves, whatever you can do to elicit emotion. That's what I found is where the hearts get changed many times, not all the time, mm -hmm. but many times. So you're trying to get people to make shifts by having them ex examine their epistemology. If I get to the heart of my strategy, yeah, it's to get people to pay attention, get hooked by a, an interesting story and then to feel along the way. Yeah. And that's what I've noticed uh, often causes the shift. Now, I hope that wasn't super boring for you. It was not me being narcissistic. I'm literally just sharing. No, I'm glad, I'm glad that you did. And it reminds me of a technique that is almost a hybrid of what you're doing with, with your audience 
and eliciting the the emotions and the narratives and the street epistemology part. And it's this movement or there's another technique that's on the West Coast, I think, called deep canvassing. These are people that go and they knock on doors. They go to specific areas. If there's a vote coming up for transgender bathroom rights or something, they'll look and see where people are at and how they vote. And they'll knock on the door and ask for a level of confidence in your position on a scale from one to 10, which is a very SE kind of thing. Uh, might, maybe even motivational interviewing, you tend to do that type of stuff. But the person, the interviewer who's knocking on the door will share a personal story, a narrative that their brother is trans or they're trans or they had this horrible experience where if the law was passed according to how the, what, what they're pushing for. So they'll, they'll make this story, this appeal, this very emotional appeal, and it can be very influencing on the person who's opened the doors and is now listening to the story. Uh, they often detect shifts in changes of confidence or positions on how they'll vote after this exchange. It's one thing that we don't do in SE, though. We don't tend to utilize emotion and narratives. Although people get emotional. <laughs> people do get emotional when they're revealing their views, for sure. Yeah. But if I was interviewing a Mormon, for example, um, it could be tempting for me to share a story where I struggled with my faith and I overcame it and I'm better because I don't believe it anymore. I could do that with the idea that they may find it compelling and that could actually sway them or convince them. There's this, um, in the spirit of SE sort of, we try not to persuade or move anybody. That's we, not your intent or is it? Well, sometimes it can be, it's, it's, it's nuanced. <laughs> there might be situations if I'm talking to somebody who's against the vaccine and they're uploading videos saying, don't take it or something, I might be more inclined to want to challenge them and con and convert them or change their view or something like that. But generally speaking, we try to at least best, I guess sort of best practice of SE is to try to take our views out of it and make it about them. Now we'll listen to their stories and entertain their feelings and, and reflect back and ask them if that's a really good way to come to a conclusion that something is true because of that experience, for example. But unless we're asked, we don't usually share our views because we don't want to influence them one way or the other. You don't want to influence them. Right. So why are you doing it? We want the person who we're speaking with to think about their reasoning and decide, am I good with that? But you, but I, I, as I watch your videos, sometimes I'm torn because you do a really good job not wanting to point or push or prod people in any direction because I think you know that's not effective. But I can't think that you're going recording your thousandth and your thousand and first and your thousand and second <laughs> interview without having a motive, right? Well, of course. I mean, I, right. I, if I talk to somebody that I disagree with and I think I'm right and I think that they're wrong and I think that they can't justify it to their own level of certainty. I want to help them discover that, but I'll also be willing to tell them that too. So that's part of, it's part of something that we're trying to do to make this a little bit more ethical is to lay it all out for the person. I'd like to ask you some challenging questions. This could be the result and you may be less sure that your view is true. Informed at the consent. End of, informed yeah. consent is yeah. really big for us. Yeah. And I think that sort of gives the green light for, the, for those types of things. Um, I also try to be open to what they're saying too, which is kind of difficult. If I'm talking to a flat earther, am I really going to be open to what they have to say? Probably not. Uh, ultimately though, what I try to do is ask them if they want to believe true things. Is it important for them to believe the truth? And if they say yes, then it's game on. I'll ask them you know, I'll keep asking them questions until they want to stop or it seems like it, we should probably be stopping. Have you ever asked the question, if you, if I had information that could demonstrate conclusively that your religious worldview wasn't true, would you want to know it? Have you ever, do you ask that? Is that common? I've asked it and I've, I've had all <laughs> sorts of answers. Many times, surprisingly, people say, I don't think I'd want to know. <laughs> yeah. I'm okay thinking that it's true, even though it may not be. And yeah. if they're willing to keep talking, then we explore, well, do you have that same outlook for other views? Mm -hmm. What is it about this view where you would be willing to compromise in that regard as opposed to some other claim? 
what might be the next best alternative to finding meaning and purpose without this belief that may not be true? So the conversation isn't over, but you can just be exploring well, what might be the impediment to, to growth here. Yeah. Yeah, in the, co in the field of psychology, it's unethical to have a desired outcome for your client, to try and impose your values on them. And so I think it sounds like you're trying to mirror either intentionally or not those ethics of it just allowing people to do introspection and to grow in, the, in a self-directed way. Pretty much, yeah. And also keeping that channel of communication open with them so that if they want to talk with you again, they would be willing to come up and talk with you again or that type of thing. Uh, we always try to end the conversation on a good note so that we can have multiple talks mm -hmm. with the person. Cause sometimes in the moment they think that this belief is the most important thing in the world to them. But then after a short talk and you leave them alone to process it and then meet with them later, they may be more further along in it and may, may be more open to considering well, maybe, maybe I can't justify this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So if you, could wave a magic wand and make religion disappear from humanity? Do you, do you feel enough confidence that humanity would be better off without religion to say you would wave that wand? Or is that too much of a hypothetical? No, no, I've, I've been asked this bef once before. Like if you could push the big button and get yeah. rid of religion. Would you push it? The, the answer that I gave then and I would give today is no. I wouldn't push it because there are probably other things that that person would fall for because their reasoning process is probably not as sharp as they think that it is. And that's what I think is happening here with religious views. We're, we're concluding that these things are true because we were taught them. They make us feel good to think that they're true. And we usually stop there. Uh, and that is probably something that humans do regardless of whether it's a religious claim or or that this, this rock is a healing rock or something along those lines that humans are very good at figuring out ways to hold on to beliefs that they can't justify to themselves. And that would happen whether religion was around or not, I think. So there's, there's a more fundamental issue that has to be addressed. Yeah. Yeah. I always like to say that you can trade down, you can lose your religious faith and then join just a different cult. Uh, oh yeah. And, and actually be worse off. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes, uh, imperfect beliefs are superior to, I guess, worse beliefs or sometimes no beliefs or structure at all. Have you ever, have you ever thought about that? That sometimes when people lose their faith, they get lost. Sometimes people do. This is one of the reasons why I volunteered for the last four seven or eight years now with recovering from religion where as we mentioned before it's a great organization because i wanted to figure out where do people go when they're done speaking with me and i challenge their views and let's say that they really do start questioning and doubting and getting rid of this belief as your listeners will know it could be a painful process and i think we have a responsibility there to let the person know that this is a potential outcome like even though you may not believe that this could happen this could happen and what kind of impact are we talking about here and uh, if they say that there would be no impact whatsoever, you might want to double check, make sure, because there probably is going to be an impact. They may not just recognize it yet. As far as your personal beliefs or views go, whether it's religious beliefs or non-beliefs, political beliefs, even issues around social justice, do you share your thoughts and beliefs and positions publicly, or do you avoid that? I try to avoid it as much as I can. Really? I do because one of my goals is to get these tools into everybody's hands. And if people think that this is a tool set that is, is primarily used by people of a specific uh, political uh, affiliation, then I think that that could be a problem. So I just kind of try to keep it on the down low. I mean, I'm not ashamed of it. You, you can probably look and see what I tweet or retweet to get a sense of where I stand politically or on religion for that matter. Or uh, on social issues? Or on social issues, for sure. Okay. So like, I have to ask you this. So I mean, yeah, by, by the topics you choose, that says something. So obviously religion you, you mentioned flat earthers. Yeah. Well, the topics I choose, I actually don't choose the topics usually. Really? Yeah. So when I flag somebody down to do an interview, I'll usually, I'll explain what I'm doing and then I'll ask them to pick the topic. 
you ever remember me doing this? Mm-hmm. Uh, to pick the topic. I want them to pick a topic that they think is true. Now, they may pick a topic that I don't think is true or I have zero interest in or I've, I'm keenly interested in. It doesn't really matter. I'll still use the same approach even if I agree with them uh, because I'm there to demonstrate the application of this tool to the people that are watching the videos. So right. the topic almost doesn't even matter. The topic is useful for broadening out the video library to show the versatility of the technique. So the topic almost doesn't even really matter to me whether I agree with it or not. Okay. So you prefer not to talk about your kind I mean, of beliefs and personally, I mean, I'll, I mean, it's pretty obvious that I don't believe in any gods. That's I'm completely talking. I'm, you have I, no I'm left leaning. I'm a left leaning person politically. politically. <laughs> yeah. When it comes to kind of LGBTQ issues, have you talked at all publicly about your views there? I, I support LGBTQ, of course. Okay, well that 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 um, brings me to a topic that was kind of important and kind of shocking to me. So, so I have a transgender child. You have a what? A transgender child. Okay. And uh, a couple. I have a child who identifies as queer or bisexual, and I have a child who identifies as asexual. So mm. uh, it, it's a very it's a rainbow family for sure. And I didn't know any of this until after I, you know, was kicked out of the church. I was excommunicated from the church. I don't know if you knew that, but I in 2015, what? I didn't know that. Yeah, in 2015, I was excommunicated. Um, and then just a couple of years ago, my oldest kid came out as transgender, and uh, I was on your site, and somehow it was. Sometimes I wake up at three in the morning, and I was on your site, and I clicked on a link, and it took me to a Peter Bogosian interview with Joe Rogan for some reason. Do I have this right? He's been on Rogan a couple of times. And I don't know how I got to that Joe Rogan interview from your site. From my site? I they- thought. I thought. And it was kind of, oh. it seemed like it was Peter Bogosian and Joe Rogan talking about kind of transgender stuff, mm-hmm. but maybe in sort of a mocking kind of disrespectful or disbelieving way. And and all of a sudden, like, I'm like, wait, that's not, that's not, um, you know, that's not you, that's some other guy. But then there was kind of that negativity mm. and it was, I was like, oh my gosh. Mm. And then it made me wonder if you, if that's one of the issues that maybe you, uh, I don't know, felt differently than me. Not that that would be bad or anything, but like, I was like, oh man, if he's sort of skeptical about kind of the legitimacy of transgender kind of things, that oh, would no. be I problematic. I disagree with people who are in the SC community and even the creator of street epistemology on a lot of issues. So we're, div- we're diverse in that lots way. Of, lots of diversity. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. When I saw Peter Bogosian was telling Joe Rogan about the study he did kind of exposing uh, the peer review academic process oh, right. as kind of, yeah, as kind of a fraught. Mm-hmm. And uh, even that I was kind of torn about because even though I know the academic peer review journal process is problematic, making a mockery of it and kind of fooling it and deceiving it yeah. felt it doesn't really didn't feel productive to me. Yeah. It doesn't really align with what we try to do in SE. I notice a lot of differences between people like Peter or James for that matter, which is another co writer, uh, Lindsay. Peter and James wrote another book to follow a manual for creating atheists called how to have impossible conversations. Mm -hmm. And it's, this actually gets back to what we were talking about a little earlier about some of the Dawkins or whatever, struggling to use a more uh, cordial approach as opposed to the combative approach. I, I, I think that there, it's really kind of funny because the person who created street epistemology may have difficulty doing that approach and putting themselves into a reflective mindset and uh, being compassionate while you're questioning somebody. Uh, You can learn the questions, you can learn the technique, but again, if you don't have the right attitude, if you don't have the right mindset, uh, if you can't see the person that you're speaking with that you disagree with as a person who just happens to hold a belief that's different from you, if you can't do that, then you're going to really struggle at doing the SE approach. And then what do you do? You probably go back to ridiculing and giving people facts and doing all the things that we don't do in SE. 
So it's been kind of, it's been a, a little bit strange to see that divergence from people who you would think, you know that they understand that there's value in the SE tool, but don't seem to be using it. Mm -hmm. And it may just be a personality trait where they, they're they incapable of using it. Or, or this is what I suspect, is that the topic is so upsetting to them for some reason that they can't put themselves into that mindset. There's something about that topic. If it was a, if it was a topic about immigration or gun control, then they'd probably be able to stay in SE mode, mm -hmm. but on some topics they can't. And I'm probably in that same boat. There's, there's probably are some topics for me. I'm trying to think of what one might be like, I don't like talking about veganism or abortion. <laughs> like I have positions on them, but I don't, and free will is another one. These are just topics that I don't like exploring using SE, and I don't like it when people use it on me for some reason. Uh, that's just a personality. Really? Trait. Yeah. You don't like it when the tables are turned. Why are you laughing, that's Tara? Not, that's not exactly right. Uh, it's just those topics in particular. I actually love it when people use SE on my claims all the time. Yeah, it's great. What are you smiling for, Tara? Oh, I just think that's funny. I don't like talking about those either. Maybe I like talking about abortion a little bit, maybe. But yeah. Yeah, veganism. I have like a long history of a family that's uh, been like vegetarian and vegan. And it would be really hard for me to reexamine, like, you know, the where my family comes from. Just feels like that's part of me, you know? Uh -huh. And it's hard to break down those topics. It's like, hey, you're hurting my family's feelings. I'll talk about Mormonism all day, though. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> veganism is like yeah, one of them. It's, it's probably just it's the same for them that there's probably just some topics that, that uh, they lose sight of the humanity. Uh, that's behind these beliefs. And I don't know why that might be the case. It's, it's discouraging to see. I don't know what more I could say about it. Like I imagine the current political climate uh, with the past and current president, I imagine you've, you've had a chance to kind of use street epistemology in that domain. And I imagine that's also very volatile. Not as much as I'd like to. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, the, of course, like, have you ever done a QAnon? I, I should know I this. I haven't. I what? Have, no, I haven't. I need to. We just, it's funny. We just released a tip sheet to give people advice on how to respond about people who are vaccine hesitant. Mm -hmm, and I was thinking it. we should probably do this for QAnon and all sorts of other stuff, the the topics of the moment. But yeah, but like I said, I've been, I've been doing a lot of strategic stuff and I've been curtailing my street interviews, but other people have been going out and talking about this stuff and, and not just going out on the street, but just having video chats or, or chats with their loved ones about these topics and then sharing those, t those conversations in the SE communities. Mm -hmm. So that, that does happen, but I, I've just been more strategically focused, getting the organization established, developing a course for this thing and finding funding. It's, mm -hmm. I've been shifting gears to look more broadly, but it's a little, it's, it's a little discouraging. It's a little frustrating too, that, uh, Sometimes I'll get messages out of the blue, like that's happened today. Where's the link to the QAnon videos? Where's the link to the vaccine hesitancy videos? You don't have vaccine hesitancy videos. I either? don't have any on my channel, wow. but there's a guy who yeah. does. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So and is that intentional? Are you just wanting to avoid those kind of third no, rail it's not, topics? It's not that I want to avoid it. Just I'm, you've been doing other things. I've, I've been doing so many yeah. street interviews. It really wears you down. It, oh, it, it's, it gets physically and emotionally draining. Yeah. Tell me know? about it. So you kind of taking a bit of a break from that. I don't think I'm going to ever do street interviews again. Okay. I think I'm done with that. Maybe we won't do them tomorrow then, Kara. <laughs> no, maybe, maybe this will be the last hurrah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I just, there's, there's other people who are doing it. And this is the point I was getting to. When did that, you stop? When did you stop? When was your last one? 20, February, 2020. Okay. So not too long ago. Okay. Right before COVID, right? Right before COVID, and I had uh, I met a couple of Mormon missionaries on the campus. Yeah, I saw I, that video. Yeah, and they, they broke you. And they converted you. They converted you. <laughs> <laughs> they bought me a sandwich. Yeah, I saw that. Uh, so that yeah, was a really good talk. Uh, that was your last several one. Talks. There were mo there were several talks after that, but um, not with the Mormons. I actually went back to that campus a couple times, hoping to have more co talks with those two guys in particular. And then I had wanted to invite them to the holidays because I figured that they were, they were not local No. and I'd love to have them over to the house for a Christmas dinner or something like that. But, uh, I couldn't find them and they never emailed me, darn it. <laughs> but I was going to, the point that I wanted to make was that it doesn't even really matter the topic 
that's being explored. Maybe I talked about this a little bit, that it's really the technique. So whether I agree with somebody or not, yeah. it's just, uh, you still ask the same types of questions. You want to understand what they think and the why, but really getting to the, the how, how are they verifying that that's a good reason for thinking it? Yeah. Okay, so again, the the topics you like to avoid are abortion, free will, and <laughs> veganism. Are those the three? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Why yeah. don't you like so talking about free which will? One, which, one, you, <laughs> which one are we talking about first? I know. I don't <laughs> no, want to no, ask no. about free will. I just want to know why you don't like it. I, I'll tell you what. I, I don't like the free will talk because I don't think I would behave any different if free will, if I had it or I didn't have it. I have the opposite concern, just that whether or not free will exists, the belief that it doesn't exist, I don't know how that's helpful to people, other than to make people oh. feel less bad if they make mistakes or do wrong, to help them be less judgy that's what I was gonna say. about others or themselves. Yeah, if someone's on death row, you might have a little bit more empathy for that yeah, person and yeah. not want to kill them, you know, because they probably couldn't control their actions in the first place. But but is, is it not, as someone who wants to feel like I'm an autonomous agent, if I'm running around thinking it doesn't matter, because, and I know that's not a fair characterization of, no free will proponents, but I just, yeah. uh, for me, I like to think that I'm in charge. It makes me feel like, like what I do matters and my choices matter. And I just, I like that feeling. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what it is for me. Yeah. But for you, the terms are so goofy yeah. and people have different ideas of what free will is. And my sense is that we don't have free will. I think I could, if somebody thought that they did have free will, I think we could explore it and realize that they couldn't demonstrate it. Sure. With street epistemology. Yeah, I think and I, I think I've even had a couple of people talk. In fact, when I was discording, like in between talks, people would say, uh, I, you know, I ask somebody about free will. I'm like, oh, okay, we'll do this one because there's a demand for it. So if there's a demand for a topic, I'll try to do it. Yeah. yeah. So how effective have you observed street epistemology to be? Like if you had to take the thousand people you've interviewed or thousand interviews, however many, how many of you shared... A thousand, probably twelve hundred, something like that. Do you even have a guess for like what percentage of the people walk away in in the short term having their beliefs transformed so much? Is there a way you can see a twinkle in their eye? Have you ever like have you ever had someone go, Oh my gosh, I don't believe anymore? It's happened. Like what's it's the, a little rare. What's the bell curve? Uh, I don't know. I uh -huh. really don't know. But I could tell you when I am speaking with somebody there does seem to be something happening when I'm speaking to them. There does seem to be a reflective moment where they're pausing, they're thinking, and there's, I don't, I don't know. I'll have to think about that. And that's really the goal. It's not, the goal isn't always to figure out where they are on their confidence level and get them to move. Like, I think that they're wrong and therefore I want to see movement down, or I think that they're right and I want to move them up or something. Ideally, the goal is to gain clarity into their views and also help them gain clarity into their own views so that they can process it, you know, on their own. Uh, the idea here is, I guess, that if a person realizes that they can't back up their belief to themselves, that might be the start of belief revision that, uh, wow, I don't have a good reason for thinking that this is true. Where's the evidence? Um, that kind of reflection could start the process on it. But as far as like how many people change their mind at the end of it, I have no idea. I have no idea because I'm not, not tracking the them. That's not the goal. And that's not the goal. It, it can be your goal. It, it, sometimes my goals can even change. Like I may go out and say, I'm going to go to this protest. I want to talk to QAnon folks and I want to help them realize that they can't back this up to their own satisfaction. That could be a goal of mine. Sometimes though, I'm, I'm in the middle of a conversation and it seems like maybe they're particularly dependent on thinking that this is true. The QAnon thing may not be the best example, but religious views. I've had people say, I would harm myself or other people if I didn't think that God was there for me. Yeah. And Sean McCraney told me that well, once. Yeah. That's my trigger to say, okay, I'm going to start easing out of this conversation gracefully here. <laughs> uh, after perhaps making sure that they really mean it, because sometimes people say this stuff because they have been told it yeah, and they don't really believe it. But if they mean it, then it's, uh, I usually just back off. That's happened a couple of times. Uh, it happened once there was this woman, she, 
she thought that a goddess was protecting her, a pagan goddess. And she seemed really dependent on it. And I, probably not as graciously, but I think I abruptly ended the interview like, well, it seems like you really need this belief and I think I'm going to end it now. Mm -hmm. And I'll be darned if she didn't email me an hour later saying, you've got me really thinking about this. I do want to believe true things. Can we meet again? Wow. And we did on camera. It was awesome. Unfortunately, she about a year later, she said that she was looking for jobs and she didn't want those videos out there of her online. So I had to take oh, those down, no. unfortunately. But at least I can talk about them in interviews like this, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost like you're not, okay, I'm really getting more clarity. You're not trying to move people on any beliefs per se, but it's almost like you're trying to teach them to fish where if they can just learn to practice yeah. and get good at evaluating the foundations of their beliefs, they'll maybe start doing it regularly exactly and and just develop the ability to refine their their beliefs and worldview is exactly. that right yeah exactly so there's there's a there's an efficiency to se that often gets missed and that is once you identify that i'm weighting my reasons for thinking that something is true through this process so the process might be well i get this warm feeling in my bosom that confirms it for me or yeah whatever other method, I, I take it on faith that it's the case, or I, I, put, I say a prayer and I'll be darned if three weeks later that, that, that something close to it happens and it confirms it for me. When you start realizing that the method that you're using to verify your reasons is faulty in some way, you start being more careful about the methods that you use to verify your reasons f across the board. So there may be thousands or hundreds of other beliefs that are affected by the recognition that I have a faulty method. So that's why I was saying. It doesn't even almost matter what claim. You could probably do SE simply by exploring reasons and methods and not even worrying about a claim. You could probably even do it there. So that, that's the idea is to get people to think about their reasoning process. Am I being careful in my reasoning here? And once you teach people how to do that, and you can do it on safer topics, but ultimately they start using it on the harder beliefs the beliefs that are core to people's identities, like these religious views. Is it basically just a form of critical thinking? I think it's, it's critical thinking in a dialectical, and it might even be critical thinking and the scientific method in a dialectical, because when you think about it, we're establishing what their claim is. That's the hypothesis. We're figuring out what their biggest reason is. That is their evidence. And then we're asking, well, how are you verifying your reasons or your evidence? That's testing. That's the method. And all this is critical thinking and science packaged in a dialectical that people tend to enjoy that can profoundly transform a person if they are honestly willing to go on that exploration with you. Have you ever been accused of just being a deconstructionist? That, that street epistemology adopted by everyone leaves everyone with no beliefs and no framework at all because they just uh, deconstruct everything because there is no real solid foundation for everything. Cause at the end of the day, it's all just words made of letters that make sounds and we're all just creating story anyway. And what does it all mean? I think somebody commented recently on a video a week ago saying like, well, I guess this just leads to nihilism. Um, <laughs> what is that, Kara? <laughs> I give a big thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> Did you give a thumbs up to that question? <laughs> You're so, pro-nihilism. Uh, I'm not so, pro-nihilism. <laughs> pro I've accepted some things just don't matter, and I just do what I can on this earth with the 90 years I'm given. All right. There is, here's the thing about SE, is that it doesn't take away your beliefs. It takes a, it, it doesn't take it away. SE isn't impacting your belief. It's impacting your confidence that the belief is true. So you can still hold a belief about a God. It's just... It lowers your confidence level. Yeah. Right? Right. Like maybe I'm 98% sure God is real. After some reflection and processing, if somebody was using this method, I might lower my confidence. I still hold a belief about God, but I'm less sure that it's actually the case. Why is that good? I, I can give you my guesses, but why do you think that's good? Why do we want a bunch of people with weaker convictions mm. as to their beliefs? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, because if you become so weak-minded in your convictions, then maybe you're just a, a pushover, or you just or lay, apathy. It's like you yeah, lay in bed all day and you don't know, care. America's I don't, okay. I don't need to vote, right? 
democracy's all right. Yeah. Capitalism's okay. Right, right. Marriage is, you know, meh. It doesn't seem like people ever go that far. Although <laughs> maybe they do. I guess the I'm less worried about that, and I'm more worried about the dogmatism. The the opposite is. I when, was just about to ask you that. Yeah, yeah, it's when you're. It's like when you're so locked into the position, yeah. you're 100 percent sure, and you just know because you know because you know, and there's nothing that's going to. Or because you feel. It's that resolute ignorance that is so problematic and dangerous. That, that that's one of the inspirations for me is is uh, if I meet somebody who's dogmatic about a position, any position, it could be free will, abortion, veganism, or God, or whatever, doesn't matter. Uh, seeing somebody recognize that they can't be 100% sure about that is monumental. I think it's even bigger than going from a 90 to a 70 on your claim or, or going from a 90 to a 10. Just realizing, oh, maybe I could be wrong on this. That is, that's a huge goal, I would say, of SE is helping people realize the problem of being dogmatic on both positions. Though being at a zero that there's no God is probably as bad or uh, as, as dangerous as being 100% that there is. Not being, just being closed-minded on it, mm -hmm. I think, can be a problem. I actually learned the term epistemic humility before I ever heard of you. But term. it's just this idea of just of being open. It's, it basically just leads to openness. Do you remember how you heard it? Was it Julia Galef by any chance? I heard no, her use it, it once. It, within a Mormon, I, everything I've learned is in epistemic a Mormon humility is, yeah. is great. Yeah. I think I made that up. Yeah, it was Kara. Probably. It was Kara. I, I think I heard it from her. That's Let's cool. go with that. <laughs> if you don't know, why not? I know it could be. Have no, but epistemic it, humility about where you heard it. <laughs> yeah, it could have been. Yeah, who knows? My confidence levels that I heard it from Kara is about a one percent, <laughs> maybe point oh one. But I can think of things that would move me up. <laughs> and I'm not dogmatic at the zero on it. <laughs> like a cheeseburger might move me up from, you know, to a point, $20 bill to flipped underneath the table. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it just, but, um, yeah. So one of the impacts of street epistemology can be openness, which can lead to growth, more, more information, updating your operating system. Yes. And, um, being open to new information and new conclusions, right? Not nihilism and deconstruction of everything. Right. Right. Yeah, hopefully you have a loving community of other people who are not dogmatic that recognize the, the benefit of questioning and doubt. This reminds me of a talk I had with a young guy who he was 100% sure God was real. I don't think he was LDS church, but something else. And he mentioned that it wasn't good to doubt. It wasn't good to question. So instead of pursuing his God belief, the entire talk was... Could it ever be good to doubt and question? And if so, you know, why? And the whole conversation was about that. And he became more open to the idea of doubt, which I thought was a real win. He saw the value in it. He was doubting things in his regular life. And he recognized that this could be a problem if I didn't also apply that to this very important belief that this God was real. Yeah. I, 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 wasn't there a book, The Gift of Doubt or something? Uh, but but basically, doubt is being a really important. Even if you're a believer, doubt is still important. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Yeah, Kara, Kara's husband Aaron just uh, just oh. joined us. <laughs> We've got a fourth camera if we want to turn it on. Aaron can join our podcast. He's a podcast host, co-host, veteran. Um, do you do lighting too? <laughs> we were really struggling with it today. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Aaron. Okay, we'll 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 be wrapping up pretty quick for today, um, yeah. if, if that's okay. Sure. Uh, so, um, so do you have beliefs now? And if so, <laughs> do you do you have any cherished, closely held beliefs at all? Of course, I do. I have lots of cherished beliefs, but I wouldn't what's, say what's survived. Well, everything. <laughs> I mean, I have a belief about God. I don't think one exists, so I would say that that's a belief, and I have a belief that it's probably to be help people who need it and tax wealthy people to cover the costs for the other people who need it. Like I have views, of course. Yeah. Positions, but Positions. not, but not beliefs. Okay. So we should probably get into definitions here. I, my definition of a belief is the recognition that you have an understanding of some sort of concept. So like, um, for example, I didn't know Aaron existed until just now. 
I now have a belief that he exists, and I also have a corresponding level of confidence that he exists. If Kara had mentioned that she has a husband, well, it probably would be not as high as it is right now. And in fact, I don't really know that you're her husband. You, he might not be Aaron you, or exactly, Kara's husband. Exactly. Yeah. So, so um, I try to think of belief as two things, the recognition of an idea and then a corresponding level of confidence that that idea is actually true or not. That's kind of how I think about beliefs. Okay. Um, I'm still fleshing that out, by the way. That's, we'll see. Maybe that'll be in the book. So you have positions, but not a lot of beliefs. Is that fair to say? I use the word position, yeah. belief, claim synonymously. Yeah. But is there anything you just believe without evidence? Oh yeah, I believe that there's life on other planets, but I don't really have evidence for that. But I would say my level of confidence that that's true is probably twenty percent. So I've got the belief, and then there's this corresponding level, and I try to think of it this way in numerical terms. Um, and maybe because I've always, I've been doing this SE stuff for so long, that's how I think of it. And that's really how we try to frame these conversations too. When I'm talking to somebody, uh, you think something is true. How confident are you that this is true? We try to disentangle the belief claim or the view or the position from the individual. And we want to get a sense of how sure they are that that's true. Uh, when you frame it that way, it helps people become more objective in their view. Like it seems like people, it's easier for people to step away from their belief claim and objectively look at it when you ask them to explain their reasoning for thinking that that's true to some degree of confidence. Yeah. So what do you think, what do you think happens uh, when we die? It seems like our bodies break down. I don't think our consciousness goes on to live elsewhere. I think that this material world world is all that there is. And so what keeps you going? Why, you know, a believer would say, why bother then? I know. I don't get that. I, I'm always perplexed at that question. Like, why do you even care then if this is all the life that there is? Like, yeah, what's what, the point? What are you talking about? Some what, what, some come from a place of pain where it's just like life's too painful. And if I don't, uh, if it's not yeah. better later... And if I don't get some sweet reward, I may not want to keep going. This is not worth it. Yeah. It, if there's a person like that, then I usually don't stand in the way of their beliefs. They can keep believing whatever they want. Cause the last thing I want to do is have somebody harm themselves. But for myself, uh, I, I want to try to go where the evidence takes me. And there doesn't seem to be any good reason to think that there's a life after this. And, but other, I mean, my life ends, but other people's lives do, do keep going you guys with your kids keep going on. My wife with our kids keeps going on. You, you and your family. Um, I want your lives to be as pain free and happy as possible. So I think that, I think what we do here in this life does matter for the people that are left. And that means something to me, whether I'm here or I go on to some afterlife after so for you, the meaning and purpose of life is what? It's family and it's, you mentioned epistemic humility and I'm actually tempted to, to, to say that because I think being humble about what you can claim to know is what you, is the mindset that you need to have a virtuous life, to make this life meaningful. You're not, you're not tricking yourself with stories that make you feel good or following somebody because they say that something is true, but they can't back it up to your satisfaction or theirs. The authentic life is, is the thing that makes this meaningful for me. Why family? What's that based on? It probably has to go to the idea that they'll be left after I'm gone there are people that I love. They've been there for me. I've been there for them. We have a, we have a history. We have a relationship. I value those relationships. Um, they mean the world to me. So I'd say that that's a big part of it. Is love a belief? Love is an emotion. Love is a feeling. You can believe somebody loves you or you can believe that you love somebody. But generally, no, I'd say it's, it's not a belief, but it's a feeling. It's a sense. Like confidence. So my sense of confidence that something is true is also a feeling, I think, just like my feeling of love. 
I mean, it sounds like you're saying one of your core pillars of meaning and purpose is family, which is based in love, which is based in a feeling, yes. which doesn't really sit on any really solid logical foundation. Well, I mean, the feelings that I'm experiencing are real to me. Um, but feelings get people in trouble. They sure do. Right. And they can be unreliable too. Uh, I could think that my family loves me when in reality they don't. Right. So I could, I could be having a false feeling. Um, in fact, I guess I would call that a belief in that case. I believe that my family loves me, uh, but I don't know for sure. Uh, it's possible that they don't. I could be deriving meaning from a feeling that my family loves me when in reality they don't. I recognize that's a possibility, but I wouldn't want to deceive myself and pretend that it was otherwise, right? It's a wise thing to be skeptical about everything, uh, to not be dogmatic about even that, even the most fundamental thing that's so important to me. I wouldn't want to be deceived if they were just tricking me or something. I don't think that that's the case, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. What has it meant to you to make such a big difference in so many people's lives? I don't know if I have, have I? It's hard to, it's hard to tell. Yeah. I mean, people, Kara's, I care for our listeners. Cares. Care, what, what would you like, say? Yeah, I, it's, it's helped you. What would you say, Kara? Oh, the things, uh, Anthony's videos. Yeah. Just the, the method of street epistemology and, doing that to my own claims, having a lot of, again, epistemic humility about, okay, the truth claims of Mormonism, demonstrably false, but I don't want to fall into other cult-like thinking, other dogmatic beliefs. And so kind of using those to apply them to a lot of things. And yeah. that led into me starting my TikTok and calling myself Nuanzo because I wanted to stay far, far away from dogma and still just be like, I don't freaking know a lot of things at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. I just want to have conversations with people. And um, yeah, it's, it's led in, uh, the techniques from SE have led into so much of the demeanor that, yeah, has carried me to right now to have this job at Mormon Stories. And I hope that comes across that I swear I'm not a nice person. I know I'm an atheist. I don't eat babies. <laughs> um, and like, it's just, I, I hope that it carries it across that I just want to have conversations with people and get to the root of what they believe, why they believe it, and not be too dogmatic that I need to impose my beliefs on people either. So it's helped me in every relationship that I've had. Wow, that's cool. I appreciate you saying that. Uh, people do reach out and say that the videos have helped them almost on a daily basis. I'll get a message out of the blue from somebody from around the world. Mm -hmm. It'd be Jakarta or something. And these videos have helped me have better conversations or they've helped me at work dealing with my boss, or I'm thinking about starting a business, a consulting business where I teach people how to do this. That's, that's exciting. Um, it's surprising too, I guess. Cause like, I, I don't know if I really set out to do that. Like I just wanted to have a good examples and show people how to do this. Uh, it does seem to be changing and helping people. It does. Uh, I, I don't know if I could deny that, but are you asking me how I feel about yeah. it? How does it feel? I mean, let's be frank. You have had a really big influence on tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of people not to mention the ripple effect. And so uh, that, and, and you're getting daily emails around the world of people saying, thank you, you've really helped. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How does that, how does that feel? It feels good. Uh, it's mixed. Part of me is really excited that they took the time to reach out and let me know that it affected them in a positive way. Part of me wonders if, if, uh, if there are more out there who just aren't emailing, like how big of a, of mm -hmm. a thing is, and maybe that leads to a little anxiety too. Like, is this, is this reaching as many people as it, as it could? Mm -hmm. Is it causing harm that I'm not aware of? Mm -hmm. You know, am I only hearing the good examples and not the bad ones? Mm -hmm. So you don't get a lot of bad feedback. No, 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 neither. None. I mean, I don't. No. I can think of one. I get, I get criticisms. <laughs> no. no, I can think of one thing that it, it made me a little bit sad as I realized I was using um, just the practices of SE on my Mormon family members. And it kind of, you have to take kind of an outsider belief and have the interlocutor kind of come with you on that. And this is going to sound really bad, but I realized that a lot of my family members are racist. 
and that they don't they can't take an outsider approach because the way that they view people of that are let's say Muslim that have darker skin that they're not able to see them on the same intellectual level. And so I, ha it was really depressing. I actually wrote a Reddit post about it when it happened because people were not willing to go on that journey with me. And I realized it wasn't going to go where I wanted it to go because I had to come to the conclusion they weren't willing to actually ask themselves if they had good reasons. Cause they know those reasons. They don't care if a Brown person has those reasons because right. they're Brown. Does right. that make sense? Yeah. So. Yeah. Sometimes you discover, Oh boy, this is a bigger I've opened this box and it's way bigger than I expected. Right. There's a lot in here that needs to be unpacked before we can even get to the claim now that I wanted to talk with them about. So, yeah, I mean, it seems to be having an impact on people, uh, mostly for the positive. I don't really get a lot of negative feedback on it at all. Uh, if anything, it's usually just, you know, why, why, why haven't you uploaded a video in three months or something like that? Like, where's your content? What are you doing? It's like, what have you done for me lately? You just, you, like, I'm working way harder than I ever have, and you just can't see what's going on at the moment. But it's happening. It's this stuff is happening. It is so hard to run a nonprofit. It's one of the hardest things. Yeah, yeah, I've it's ever, challenging. It's ever done. It's challenging. Yeah. So, um, why have you not written a book? God damn it. Or have you? <laughs> and I don't use that word often, but I'm going to use it today. <laughs> Why have, have you written a book? And if I not, haven't. what the holy, f say it, Kara. I'm not allowed to get fired. Okay. I, I what got the, the fetch? point. <laughs> we'll do it Mormon. Well, what the fetch, Anthony? The fetch, Why haven't Anthony? you written a book? Well, I got, I, I was have you thinking, tried? No, I haven't tried yet. What? I haven't started it, but I've been thinking about writing one. I was thinking of earmarking 2022 strictly for that for writing a book because all in favor I'm in favor of it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Keep going. Sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> so I got sidetracked with this self-directed course. It's taking way more time. And I, I think it's the best use of my time is to get these instructions down and these, these guidances to people in a really clear way so that we can really start teaching people how to do this. And then my journey into all this and the behind the scenes stuff and some of the, some of the surprising things that happened when I was interviewing people and, and after the fact, I want to write about that. And even some of the tension, some of the tension maybe behind the scenes between other people in the movement and, and things that I think I could, there's a lot to say about this whole journey. Um, probably what I would do if, if I, if I was going to start writing a book is I would, is there a way to print your Twitter timeline? <laughs> I think there is. You can download it, right? I think I would go to there because I was pretty good about just keeping my thoughts updated there. Mm -hmm. And I think that's pretty mm -hmm. much the structure of my book right now. Wow, that's a good idea. Yeah. I just realized how I'm going to end this interview. So so we are going to have a part two tomorrow where we're going to dig into uh, what street epistemology is. Cool. We're going to role play it. And, we're gonna really, and, and this is just, maybe this is indulgent, but I think you're important enough to just everything that we've just talked about, I'm really glad there's a record of it. Maybe you will or won't be glad that it's there. I'm glad it's there. <laughs> and this is it. my fetching podcast. So, uh, yeah. but anyway, what, but I just figured out how I want to end today. Okay. Okay. Um, I want to ask you what my listeners can do to help you do two things. Finish that fetching course mm. quicker mm. and write that book quicker. If it means give you money, if it means give you different types of volunteers, expertise, how can my listeners who care about you and value you and your listeners and viewers, if they happen to tune in? Because one thing that I've learned that's allowed us to do what we do is sometimes when you need something, you have to ask for it. And sometimes when you need something, you have to ask for it for 10 years until you get it. But you have to ask sometimes over and over and over again. Yeah. So what do you need most to write that book within a year? And what do you need most to get that course done within a year? If you could okay. wave a magic wand, what yeah. needs to appear in your lap and how can these listeners and viewers make that happen? Okay. So the, the book I think I can do pretty much on my own. I've got, I've got some resources with people who have written books before that are willing to help me structure it and do all that stuff. But I really don't want to start the book until the course is done. So with that in mind, I would say what we need for the course is donations, of course, to help us pay for the. How much money? How much money would would sort of seal the deal? Do you even have an estimate? If we had forty grand, I think that would be good 
40 grand would Dude, help us. I can totally help you raise 40 grand. For we're, sure. We're actually thinking about doing a fundraiser before the end of this year. Maybe we can coordinate and do something. I, is that cool? Kara, are you in? What kind of question is that? I'm like willing to like <laughs> quit this and walk out of here with Anthony. <laughs> yeah, and I, I would be supportive. Uh, <laughs> like, I love talking about this stuff so much. Of course, I'd love we to get see you on the review done. videos that we do. Yeah, okay, I'm okay, there. I'm but so there. Totally. So like forty, dude. Let's. We're gonna have a fundraising campaign. We're gonna raise you forty grand, and I'm just saying it right now. We're gonna raise you, help you That'd raise forty incredible. grand. Okay, keep going. So th let me tell you where we put that. We we have an illustrator picked out. She's great to draw illustrations for the course. And we also need to pay for a lead editor to go over this, the material that we've written. So you've got subject matter experts who are, they're great at SE, but we're not the best writers. So we need somebody to take that writing and put it into a good form. There's a marketing component to this that's been overlooked. We really need to, to work that angle. And then related to the course is the development of the, the website that needs to have a learning management system as a back end. So learners can log in, create an account, track their progress. That will lead to a certification program for SE. This will lead to consulting services and a whole business arm of SE. <laughs> so the, the course really is the linchpin, and that's the biggest thing holding us back and holding me from being able to write my book. Uh, can, we, can we get the <laughs> curriculum of the course written and then the book written? Because I think writing the book is going to help you be able to fundraise to create the learning management system ah. and then the certifications and the, I don't know. And the training. I, sometimes writing a book really gets you indoors. It, it, it could, it could. There, there's also something to be said for getting the course written and tested with the SE community first and working out the kinks. Right. So there's the writing of the course and there's the testing of it and the focus group testing and all. And I'm that. just saying websites and learning management systems. I used to work for Microsoft mm. and I worked for MIT Yeah, and I did, educational curriculum stuff. Sometimes the technology and the LMS system can really, and the website and web tech can really bog you down. I, that's all I'm saying. Oh, yeah. And he used yeah. to date Renee Zellweger. Yeah, we got him. No, that's not what I'm, <laughs> I'm saying. Just... <laughs> I'm just trying to, I'm trying to what? be a consultant. <laughs> I miss something. <laughs> I just like when you're like, I used to do a bunch of really cool stuff. And I'm just adding in more humor. What am I here for? Renee Zellweger and I went to high school together. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, but, but okay. So anyway, yeah, I, I would love to ask some of my listeners th this kind of, it's like a magic eight ball. Like sometimes this podcast audience, you just kind of put that wish out there mm. and people rise up to make it happen. This sounds like the law of attraction almost. So I do not. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's the law of the podcast. Okay. It's the law of social well, media. And you, you've been doing this for so long, you know your audience very well. And in fact, we did a fundraiser about two years ago, pre-COVID. I wanted to, to, to do a trip out here to Salt Lake City to go to general conference and do some interviews with people. So we advertised that in the SE community and in the ex-Mormon community. And we raised, I don't know, I think we raised 5000 or $10,000 in a matter of two weeks. So it's been, it can happen if we- oh. People aren't put it together and get it out there. Yeah. It's going over here. But that'd be really cool. And it, it would go to good use and really get that course out there and give, give people the tools. What we're developing in this course for street epistemology is far better than the two books that have preceded it. And that PDF that I mentioned, and even the tutorial, my own tutorial videos, I want to take those down because those won't be the best representation of how to do this. They aren't today. They're dated. They need to be replaced. And this is the way to go. So what I'm about to do, I learned on my mission as a Mormon missionary. It's called the commitment pattern. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you to make a commitment. So that we're not live streaming now. Actually we are, but we're not, it's not public. Yeah, yeah. We are going to be releasing this in a week or two or okay. three. Can you commit to us to have a donation, a donation button or a campaign ready so that when this airs, we can point people to it and they can start giving you money. We can because we just had our board meeting and we already voted to do a fundraise, fundraising campaign for the month of December. So we're those wheels are in motion. So that's we're good to go on that. You got it. So we can we be one of your fundraisers, please? Of course. Anthony? I'd love to have you be one of our <laughs> fundraisers. I think that would be great. 
Yeah. I, I think that would be a great contribution, Kara. You're in. Kara's mm -hmm. already quitting. Kara just Kara just texted me her text of resignation. These days, what? Gen Zers re <laughs> resign over text. We're not hiring yet. Kara resigned. You have to be She's a coming to work for you. I will miss you, Kara. Thanks, it's yeah. been great working with you. Yeah. Thank no, you. No, quite honestly, though, like before <laughs> I even started this stuff, I tried to figure out how I could do SE on the street. And I was like, that's a whole other, like, that's a big thing. Oh, really? So, there's, there's so many variations you can go to right. a park. And you don't have to do it on the street. Do you guys ever table? Do you go to do you, farmer's markets we or need table? We need to. Like, let's get into this tomorrow, but I really want to like call on my audience to start practicing okay. street epistemology with all of their Orthodox believing Mormon family members. Oh, and then, that's good. And then taking notes and reporting back. Okay. I want it to become a movement within the ex-Mormon community. I really do. The usage have, of street epistemology. I, if I have awesome. one critique of the ex-Mormon community, it's the thing we talk about all the time with the backfire effect and that, you know, you want to take people on this ride with you of like, I discovered all this information. You should discover it too. And like the Nephi effect of like, don't lose the gleam in your eye for me, mom and dad. But that's so many, a mil, that's like a millionth degree away from where people need to start, which is with Essie. Yeah. Right. And Anthony's like, Nephi? Who's Nephi? What's Nephi? <laughs> you guys know what I mean. Mormon stories listeners. There's, there's also some important things that we should probably cover when we, so the next time we sit down, we're going to be going over what, uh, how to do SE. Yep. Is that right? And role play. So if the majority of your audience you think will be using SE with loved ones, then there's other things that we should be talking about in addition to how to do it. There's certain considerations that I think are really important. SE with a stranger on the street who's not expecting it is far different than doing SE with your aunt who you have this long relationship with. If it's okay, I I know you you may not come to the comedy hour tonight, which means you may have a spare moment or two to think about, um, and you can change your mind. But if you don't, and you have a few minutes to think about it, I think the main role play we should do is, is, is you play the role of the ex-Mormon who has recently lost their faith, right? And Karen and I can play the role of like the parents or the siblings who oh. are still Orthodox believers. Oh, that would be great. Would you be willing to sure. think about a, just a tiny bit like how sure. how we might approach that? Because I, that's gonna be the scenario that's most relevant. It's right. we're trying to like not blow up our relationship with our parents, with our siblings, with our children, mm -hmm. with our aunts and uncles and cousins, with our uh, community members. So how do we do that in a way that doesn't go south, that doesn't turn Fantastic. hostile, but okay. that helps Orthodox Mormons think through? Do, what do you think, Kara? Yeah, that, I can't wait. So yeah. okay, this is an interesting scenario. As I understand, you want to be the parents who we'll are, role play the believing, you're, you're believing Orthodox Mormons. Mormons. And we know I'm, that I'm the doubting, we know that our we know. deconstructing son or whatever, yeah, or just just the the interlocutor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> is that the word? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the the well, the interlocutor is usually the person making the claim. But oh, the inquisitor. I, well, what's the word? You I, tell me. Interlocutor. Well, interlocutor technically means like we're both interlocutors to each other. Okay. But in SE, we usually mean that's the person who's making the claim. Who oh, has okay. Belief. okay. What, so, what's your role? That's what I was wondering. You don't know? You don't know well, the name this, of? Like in the, the interviewer? Or? Oh, yeah. Uh, interviewer. Okay. Okay. Uh, we usually say se -er, se -er? The, the person doing SE. Okay. S-E-E-R. Okay. S -E -E -R. okay. Uh, but yeah, interviewer or the, faci the facilitator. So in this scenario tomorrow, would I be the person, you would be the ones making the claims about your religion and that's yep. true, and yep. but you have to believe it or you're going to go to hell and all this yep. stuff, right? Okay. Yeah, you would, you so would be- There's so many topics, because so many truth claims, down to things like, of down to things that I think we have, even nuanced Mormon beliefs, I think would be interesting to get into about like, well, uh, of course, you know, X, Y, and Z, uh, the temple is only for, you know, believing people, but what if we want to start letting people who are not, you know, active temple believing people in the church? Like, there's so many topics in Mormonism yeah. that people disagree over. But again, he, yeah, and I think you made a really clear content is less important than structure, too. But It is. But, but it's still fun. Yeah. Content's yeah. fun. Yeah. I'm also yeah. thinking, in this scenario, would the person who's the deconstructing Mormon be defending I would, I would think that they're going to be def trying to defend their views of non-belief as yeah. opposed to oh, yeah. questioning the parents about theirs. Well, that's the whole thing is that, you know, w maybe we'll start with, with you saying to us, your parents, mm -hmm. uh, mom and dad, I've lost my faith. Yeah. And then we're going to say to you, uh, this is a disaster. This is a tragedy. You've right. ruined our eternal family. 
and you're going to wreck your life. And then it, there's going to be a two things you have to do. You're going to have to kind of like help, help ask questions that will help a parent yeah. maybe start to think differently right. about their loved one who has lost their faith. But then maybe you can finesse and elegantly shift that conversation to helping, uh, you know, as it evolves to beliefs, helping the believing, loving Orthodox parents start to think about the foundations of theirs. Does that yeah. make sense? Or, or, yeah, I, I yeah. could probably do both. I want to help you understand why I don't believe, but I'd also, if you're willing, let me explore why you think that you're right. Yeah. But I, would a son, you know, would a son really do that to their parents? I, maybe. No. I don't know. Do they? You haven't much envisioned a, a children using street epistemology with their parents. I haven't. Really? Yeah, I'm sure it happens, but I, I don't hear of any. Most of the examples of SE we see are with strangers on the street, but most people who do SE are with loved ones. That's the, that's, that's, that's the dilemma that we have. I mean, the two use cases I think that are going to be most common are going to be spouse to spouse, where yeah. one spouse believes and one doesn't, and then ch child to parent, adult right. child to Yeah, we can do either, either scenario or both or whatever. The role play is a little tough because we're pretending yeah it's ideal if it's a real conversation like yeah. so if you if you literally had a, a believer who can come in and sit down and we can really explore their belief but i don't know if that's feasible or not i asked some but there might be some at the conference people are a little afraid. maybe we can do some of the ta we're gonna have a table for se i think it might right? be loud though did you guys get my shirts that i sent you i'll have to check at home did i send them here i did you shut them to my home yeah 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 well karen and i have practice of decades of belief so <laughs> yeah yeah we, we i'm sure you'll have... do a fine job representing the position <laughs> yeah. Yeah. i was like uh, super conservative lds half in the church half in like evangelical christianity like everything uh in this whole other sphere than i am now so that was two years ago so mm. all i have to do i can put that that brain cap back on Here's for... a do you want to put that cap back on? <laughs> i do <laughs> that's the question Kara likes to make the joke that role play is one of her favorite things <laughs> <I> <laughs> like why are you looking at aaron I, why are you looking at aaron? I'm uncomfortable well, what was that <laughs> not with him just kidding that was a joke i love my husband very much um no i i, I think that it would be really fun to do um, a role play, but I understand what you mean that it's different between somebody that you have an emotional tie yeah, to that you're going to sure. see again for sure. all the time. Yeah. We don't want to set, we don't want to set your audience up for failure either by yeah. presenting a false sure. example. We want to make it as realistic as possible, but we also want to point out what's happening too. So I'm, yeah. what I'm thinking is we can role play and then I'll say pause. And so did you notice what happened here that we've got this, we've got this tension going on and what I'm going to try to do next with this question is try to address that. I think we can talk people through it. Okay. Yeah. All right. So this has been for me a very wonderful couple hours. We're two, almost three hours in. Uh, thank you so much, Anthony I for it. today. Yeah. Kara, thanks for coming in. Yeah. Thanks for coming in. Delightful. And delightful discussion. Thanks, Anthony, for flying out. For sure. No and coming to Thrive. Yeah. yeah you're going to speak at Thrive. Um, yeah. I, I was actually thinking maybe that night before. So Saturday night. Uh, Wait, but let's talk Thrive in just one second. Um, yeah. That, well, it's about Thrive. Oh, it was, oh. Well, per, per, for my talk for Thrive, what I was oh. thinking is one of these nights when I go out and pe talk to people, I want to get a sense of maybe, or maybe you even know what they would like to hear, what would be most interesting to them. Is it advice on how to talk to loved ones? Is uh, it, should it be more broad? Cause it's just 15 minutes. I'll, I can't get into yeah. too many details. Let me wrap up this as if I'm ending the episode and then mm -hmm. I, we can have that talk. Is that yep. okay? Sounds okay. Good. So just really quickly, it's awesome that you're gonna be speaking at Thrive. We're so glad you came today. And uh, I wanna end this episode because by the time this airs, Anthony's gonna have a donation button up that's launching a new campaign where we're going to help raise forty thousand dollars for uh street epistemology international you got it is that the nonprofit? yes which is a 501c3 nonprofit. so your donations will be tax deductible in the united states and they'll file a 990 so they'll be transparent in their finances which is an important thing and we're going to help him raise 40 grand or more so listeners and viewers that's my call to you as i end this episode right now Go to either streetepistemology.com or mormonstories.org 
where this episode is or in the show notes on YouTube or Facebook or wherever you're consuming this episode on your little iPhone in the description, there'll be a link. Click on that donation button today. Don't give your money to Mormon stories. Give your money to street epistemology. Let's be good Samaritan uh, ex-Mormons and support a very worthy cause. And hopefully we'll have you back in a year pimping. Is that a bad word? Pushing your book. Or the, the completion of the course and maybe the announcement of the start of the book. Okay, I'll take it. <laughs> How about that? That's a good negotiation. <laughs> In a year, we'll have him back announcing the completion of the course and the beginnings, launching okay, okay. of the beginnings we've of the set book. set a high bar here. Is that all right? Let's go for it. We've done much, we've done much more. Yeah. We can do this. Yeah. We can do hard things, right? Thanks Kara? for doing that. Yeah, and I just wanted to add that you did an interview with Marriage on a Tightrope with Alan Mount. So yeah. I want to add that to the show notes because um, this is not your first like introduction into the ex-Mormon podcasting kind of world. Yeah, right? I talked to them maybe three years or so ago. I think we had technical issues. The phone dropped three or four times, if mm -hmm. I remember right. It was a really great conversation. Alan's so smart. So is Katie. Oh, Katie and Alan are brilliant. And he's fantastic on yeah. TikTok. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's great. I love his TikTok. Ooh, shout that. out to Alan. Alan, you just got called out in a positive <laughs> way by Anthony <laughs> Michael Musk. That's, that's, a high, that's high praise right there. Oh, wow. He does great work. All right. Well, thank you so much for today. And uh, sure. we're excited. So those of you listening, viewing, it, by the time you watch this, you'll be able to go right to part two. And we are going to dive deep into what street epistemology is, how to use it, how not to use it. And we're going to role play and we're going to have some fun. So just tune right back in. Thanks for listening. Thanks for viewing. Thanks for supporting Anthony. And we'll see you guys all again very soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Thanks, Kara. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Anthony. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me on.